Cloud recording done. Sergeant Martinez, you may take it away with the opening. Good morning and welcome to today's New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Public Safety. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please silence your electronic devices. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so via email at the following address, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council Dot NYC dot GOV. Thank you for your cooperation. We are ready to begin. Good morning, and thank you for joining today's virtual hearing of the Public Safety Committee of the, of the City's Policy Policing uh, Reform Process. I'm Council Member Adrian Adams, Chair of the Public Safety Committee. I'd like to acknowledge that we're joined this morning by my colleagues, council members, Powers, Holden, Menchaca, Riley, and Lewis. We are here today to hold an oversight hearing on the city's police reform and reinvention collaboratives. This summer, our city and our country were rocked by yet another example of how we undervalue black lives. We watched the murder of George Floyd by a police officer in Minnesota. Millions took to the streets to say that black lives matter and that we won't tolerate police brutality. As a result in June, Governor Andrew Cuomo issued an executive order directing every city in the state to create a policing reform plan by April 1st. The city got a very late start, and it wasn't until October that the administration started the process. Now, when the city announced that Jennifer Jones Austin, CEO and Executive Director of the Federation of Protestant Welfare Agencies, Alva Rice, President and CEO of the New York Urban League, and Wes Moore, CEO of Robin Hood, were key advisors who would work on the collaborative, I was extremely hopeful. I couldn't have asked for a more impressive group. Jennifer, Arva, and Wes are some of the most outstanding, dedicated New Yorkers that I know. And it's not just Jennifer, Arva, and Wes that were willing to serve and do the work. We've heard again and again from advocates, but they feel totally shut out of this process. The city says they've been included, but if the police commissioner and the mayor aren't willing to give weight to their voices, if they don't allow them to be part of a truly collaborative process, then I'm afraid we're just wasting their time. Here we are, here we are, seven months after the governor's executive order, and I have nothing to review this morning, nothing to give you feedback on today, nothing concrete to speak of, to enlighten and inform of any progress at all. It's a real missed opportunity, and I question the value of the work you have done. Listening sessions with no direction aren't going to get us anywhere. I'm concerned about the NYPD's role here. It's not hard to see that they're leading this process but I've yet to see a true commitment to reform from the NYPD. I question when they can partner, whether I question whether they can partner with others to reform themselves. Among other things, to envision a force that doesn't handle responding to every mental health call or offering services to the homeless, not to mention reducing police misconduct and the excessive use of force and mandating definitive consequences for bad behavior. If the leadership of the NYPD didn't get the message this summer on what's wrong with policing in America and in New York City, I quite frankly don't know if they ever will. But I do wanna work on this together. 
I want to get to a place where I trust that the administration is working in earnest on this plan. But I need to see that you're serious. New Yorkers need to see that you're serious. And what we don't need are empty promises or more training, quote unquote, that will fix this. We can have new training all day and every day. We can have the best of the best come in to run training sessions. We can update the patrol guide. We can put in new rules to improve transparency. But if leadership is not committed to change, this plan won't be worth the paper it's written on. Culture eats breakfast. Culture eats policy for breakfast. So we need to see that the administration is serious about more than just changes around the margins. Today is not just about hearing from the administration, though. We're going to hear and listen to the people and the groups that have been on the ground during this, doing this work for years and years. They didn't just come around to reform this summer. They actually live it. So I hope, no, I expect that the administration will have its people watching and listening to this hearing until the very end. And because this is so very important, I don't want everyone to wait until after the administration testifies. We're going to do something different today. We're going to start today with the families of four New Yorkers who lost their lives because of police brutality. Anthony Baez, Mohamed Ba, Ellen Feliz, and Delron Small. We need to start this hearing off by hearing this morning what's really at stake here. This is a matter of life and death. And before I turn it over to our moderator, I wanna thank you all for being here today, especially the families. I know how difficult this must be for you. And I can't say enough how much I admire your courage and your determination to see things change as we all are, as I am, to see things finally change in this city and we won't let you down. I'd like to acknowledge that we've also been joined by Council Member Rosenthal. I'll now turn it over to our moderator, Community Council Daniel Ades, to go over some procedural items. Thank you, Chair Adams. Uh, I'm Daniel Adams, Council of the Committee on Public Safety at the New York City Council. Before we begin testimony, I wanna remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. Members of the administration who are testifying will not be muted during the Q&A portion of the administration testimony. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. Members of the administration, I will call on you shortly for the oath and then again when it is time to begin your testimony. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to three minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer questions. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov if you have not already done so. The deadline for written testimony is 72 hours after the hearing. Chair Adams has also asked me to note for the public that we have a, a number of witnesses scheduled to testify today. We expect this to be a long hearing, but we will be reviewing written testimony, which is also part of the record in case you need to leave before you are called to testify. Before we hear from representatives from the administration, there will be a panel of witnesses from impacted families. I'll just read those names quickly. Iris Baez, Hawa Ba, Sammy Feliz, and Victoria Davis and Victor Dempsey. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Uh, for panelists, once you're called to testify, a member of our staff will unmute you and the sergeant at arms will set the timer, then give you the go ahead to begin. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. We'll now turn to the first panel. Iris Baez. Time starts now. Ms. Baez, you have to click the unmute when it gets prompted on your screen.
Ms. Baez, you're still on mute. You okay, hear me you're... now? Yes. Yep, you're good now. I am Iris Baez, the mother of Anthony Baez. Anthony was murdered by NYPD Francis X. Lavori, 1994. Lavori put him in a chokehold that was banned by the de police department in 20 years before Eric Gartner was killed. I want to thank the council members, Andrea Adams and chair of public safety com community and the city council for hearing the families first today. Members of the NYPD murdered um, the, the family of the NYPD that murdered the under dangerous uh, of little kept New York is not, the killers of our children are not being held accountable for the murder of our children. I've been fighting nonstop police brutality and racism and violence for 26 years. I helped pass the city council law, safety act, the right to know act, the repeal 50A and special prosecutor law. I sat next to Wen Carr every day when Pantaleo disciplined trial to make sure that there wasn't um, any perjury done there, to make sure that she was gonna be okay because they murdered her loved ones and nobody got fired. I probably, I'm proudly and only say that I saw the police officer that murdered my son go to federal prison. I'm the only one, but that doesn't, and I didn't get justice. None of the family has gotten justice. We're tired and promises and from the government. Talk is cheap, but law created change if you don't have the courage to back it up. We have other families on the panel with me who are still fighting police killing of their loved ones. Victoria, Victor had been fighting for five years for Dan, Dan Rell and Wayne Isaac be, to be fired. I've been hearing that Governor Cuomo is asking to, to the city uh, can tell you how that way New York is handling, it's terrible. The governor, the, the mayor does not know how to put the police in its place. City, the city officials say they do, they want reform from the police. They say what they think, but in here, behind closed doors, they do what they want and say what they want. They don't really mean changes for the community of Black and, and Latino. I'm they, sorry, Ms. Baez. Yes. I'm sorry, we're just gonna have to pause for one second. We're having some administrative issues, okay? Just give us one second, okay? I'm sorry. Just give me back my second. <laughs> <laughs> Will do. Let's stop the time and just restart it. Just give us one second. Okay, Ms. Baez, um, you can begin. Can we restart the, the clock, Pedro, to where she left off? Thank you. You hear me? Yes, we can hear you. You can begin. Okay. After Anthony was killed 26 years ago, I organized town hall meetings 
police came, elected officials came. They said everything that the community wanted to hear, but today there's no change. 20 years later, Eric Gartner was choked to death. His mother had to fight for five years to get Pantaleo fired. De Blasio still hasn't fired Pantaleo. After Anthony was killed, uh, they retrained the police, but did not nothing. You can you can retrain a police, but the police don't are not being trained properly. So all that money, that taxpayers' money, go to waste. The mayor's process is fake. We make change, no change. The only way make changes is to have other people, not the NYPD, not the Blasio, have to control of the process. Family like mine need help that that leads. We need the city council to to be the people's voice. We need you to help make sure that the officials that kill Rondell, Mahama, K Kwasi, Anthony Williams, Allen um, Feliz are all fired immediately. We we can't keep making families fight for for years and years just to try to get an uh, officer fired. We need to understand why the family support defunding the police. We need the black the we and the black and white Latino youth are are the ones who suffer the most because of police violence. We need you to work with us so we can move move some of the money from the police department to the community. Our, so our community can be safe from violence, including violence from the police. We need you to work directly with the families and people to pass strong laws, pass strong law panels. <clears throat> so Como can process, not shame, sham, and plan fake reform. We, um, <clears throat> sorry, an activist and a leader murdered, um, they put me in this position to be an activist and a leader after they murdered my son. I had no choice. Will you work with me so we can, don't have to keep fighting the same fight years and years so we can really end police violence? Please let me know. Uh, thank you and God bless you. Thank you, Ms. Baez. Thank you for your testimony. Next up will be Hawa Ba, mother of Muhammad Ba. Time starts now. Hawa Ba. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes. Good morning, everyone. My name is Hawaba. I'm the mother of Mohammed Ba, who was killed on September 25th, 2012, in his own home. My son, Mohammed Ba, I thank everybody today. I thank Chia Adam and everyone who in the audio today to listen to the family who lost their loved one in the police violence. My son, Mohammed Ba, was an honor student, taxi driver, hard workers. He was loved from his family and the neighbors. Mohammed was not feeling well. I signed like he was not happy. I flew all the way from Guinea to New York to help him. I called and I want, want to get in an ambulance. In sending the ambulance, the police came first. I told them, I don't call police, go away. They told me this is how the system work, which is why we need to change the system. The police came first 
Edwin Matteo, Andrew Grace, Michael Gray, shoot Mohammed eight times in his own home. Edwin Matteo fired the last shot at close range while my son was already on the ground. That happened. The officer, Lieutenant Matteo, let that happen. I want for all of you, help me continue pushing all the officers who involved killing my son and the other people, they should be fired immediately. This is happening on and on. And the NYPD who murdered my son stay collecting the NYPD paycheck without holding any liability. First, we need accountability for our youth one. The NYPD cannot help the black and brown people. They should not respond for the emotional distress when somebody is suffering. It's not make no sense for someone with gum and can unless to discriminate the person who's suffering and kill. Officer Matteo, Andrew Craig, Michael Lissitra are still working and collecting the paycheck for the from NYPD. They should be fired immediately. Time there, is, there is so many things you can learn from my son. Sorry. First, we need accountability. The officers who model my son and all the other. Please, this should be fired immediately from the NYPD. I need you continue pushing for everything defunding the NYPD. That money should go in our community need, like mental health, education, housing, and other necessary why our family need for safety. Finally, the mayor and the city council should defund the NYPD so that money can go to the necessary need for our community. The only way to stop police violence and killing is to defund the, the police that money should put in our community need. The services. Thank you for everyone who listening to me today. But just the listening is not enough. I want you to create a space which you can act as we said. Thank you, Ms. Fa. The next panelist will be Sammy Feliz, brother of Alan Feliz. Time starts now. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am Sammy Feliz, the brother of Alan Feliz. On October 17th of 2019, my brother was unjustly stopped in his car beaten, tasered, shot, and killed by NYPD Sergeant Jonathan Rivera, officers Michelle Almanzar and Edward Barrett in the Bronx. I remember one day I fell into a well while visiting relatives in the Dominican Republic. And even though Alan was very young, he jumped in to help me. He could have run to get to one, but he risked his life to help me. His personality was already mature and caring. He stayed that way the rest of his life until NYPD took it. The day that they killed Alan, Rivera, Almanzar, and Barrett falsely alleged he wasn't wearing his seatbelt, but when they got to the car door, they admitted he was. There is video of this. The, shop, the stop should have ended there, but instead NYPD escalated, and moments later, my brother, who was unarmed, was dead. After Sergeant Rivera shot Alan, Officer Barrett aggressively yanked his limp body from the car, exposing his genitals. After this, none of the officers had the decency to cover Alan up. Instead, they left him bleeding in the road, cuffed and exposed. 
In spite of this, Attorney General James did not charge these officers. Mayor de Blasio had nothing to say. The NYPD has taken no disciplinary action and Rivera, Almanzar, and Barrett are still collecting NYPD paychecks. My family and I are calling for the fire of Sergeant Jonathan Rivera, officers Edward Barrett and Michelle Almanzar. Sadly, my family story is not unusual. So many other families are fighting for accountability. As I stand with these other families by calling for the firing of the officers who killed Delron Small, Eric Gardner, Antonio Williams, Kawasi Trawick, Mohammed Ba, and others lives who have been taken by the police. The NYPD violence is a very serious problem in the city and the reform process following Governor Cuomo's executive order, it is his own big problem. Mayor de Blasio's response has been a sham from the start. He waited until the last minute to announce public meetings and has left the NYPD dictate the process. Community engagement has been an illusion and the meetings are just NYPD propaganda sessions. We need to reframe this process. If you want to reform the police and make it a safer city, we have to take money from the NYPD and invest in our communities. We cannot afford for our communities to be starved for resources during the pandemic while the NYPD's budget is giving special protection. We need resources for education and for healthcare. I work in a nursing home and last year we didn't have enough money for PPE. If some of the NYPD bloated 6 billion budget had gone to the nursing home I work for for proper protection, we could have saved at least 30 lives where I work. The city council and the mayor must act by substantially defunding the NYPD and the FY22 budget. And this can be done by reducing the NYPD roles in our lives. Get the NYPD out of traffic enforcement, mental health response, schools, and social services, and cut their headcount. Firing abusive officers like Rivera, Barrett, Almanzar, and other officers I named earlier, defund the NYPD of their salaries and benefits, defund the NYPD of the cost of their misconduct, civil suits and judgments and settlements from the year before, the worst police units and precincts which are sued much more should get even bigger cuts. Finally, I close by saying, you who are watching this hearing live or reading about it later, put pressure on the police commissioner, the mayor and the city council to make real change. That means taking it to the streets by marching for justice for Alan Feliz, Delron Small, Eric Gardner, Kawasi Trawick, Mohammed Ba, Antonio Williams, and other who have been unjustly killed by the NYPD in our own city, just like so many march for George Floyd. Thank you all for your time and God bless. Thank you very much, Mr. Feliz. Thank you. And the last panelists of this panel will be Victoria Davis and Victor Dempsey, siblings of Delron Small. Time starts now. Okay, can you guys hear me? Okay, so my name is Victoria Davis and I am the sister of Delron Small. I'm gonna thank you, Speaker Johnson, Council Member Adams, and the rest of the council members present today for taking the time to listen to my testimony and the testimonies of other families whose loved ones were killed by NYPD. I hope and expect that, that Mayor de Blasio and the NYPD are listening to myself and all families. Two years ago, my brother and I testified before the city council on the failures of the NYPD to, to discipline officers and the system in which they, dis they discipline or lack of. We told the story of our older brother, Delron Small, who was on his way home from a 4th of July barbecue in 2016 when he was shot and killed by Officer Wayne Isaacs, who was off duty at the time, but still operating in the capacity of the NYPD officer when he killed Delron. Uh, Delron was killed in front of his girlfriend, his stepdaughter, and his four-month-old baby. Delron was killed one day before Baton Rouge police killed Alton Sterling and two days before Minnesota police killed Philando Castile. Officers in those cases were fired, but almost five years later, we are still fighting to get Mayor de Blasio and NYPD to serve discipline charges on Wayne Isaacs for murdering our brother. The CCRB substantiated charges against Isaacs in October, 
and sent them to the NYPD. It is now three months later. And as far as I know, the NYPD still hasn't served those charges on Isaacs. I believe the NYPD is trying to avoid firing Isaac by continuing their years of delay and playing games with our family and with fellow New Yorkers. I work for the city and my job was more in jeopardy than Isaac's because I had to take a leave to attend trial against Isaac that the attorney general did. And I had to take time off to organize uh, and, and rally for justice for my brother. I can tell you now that if I had killed someone in cold blood and lied the way Wayne Isaacs did, after murdering my brother, I would have been fired from the city immediately. Daron was my brother, but he was also like my father. He was also like my father to myself and my younger brother, Victor. After our mother died, she died when we were small children. I gave birth after trial. And as a result of that unjust verdict, I ended up naming my son Justice because that's what we continue to fight for justice. And that's what I'm demanding and hoping to get. I am here today for Dalran, but I'm also here for every black New Yorker and New Yorker of color who has experienced violence by the NYPD. Officers like Wayne Isaacs are dangerous. They are danger to New Yorkers and should be fired immediately. There is no reason why families like the families of my, mine, Muhammad Ba, Kowalski Trawick, Antonio Williams, Alan Felice should be here fighting for all of these years after, after these murders and officers haven't been fired. We need you to take our demands very seriously and defunding the NYPD and allocating those funds to building communities that, and programs that will keep communities safe. We are not campaigning to defund the police out of vengeance. We're fighting for a decrease to the NYPD's outsized, outsized power. Um, I have a background in health education, and I can tell you now that part of the problem is we let the NYPD run the city instead of understanding many things that are needed in public, as a public health approach. And those are things that will keep New Yorkers safe. I believe that I'm running out of time, but I, lastly, I would just say that um, I am, I'm hoping that you all will stand with us to make sure that we cut the power and the budget of the NYPD. They should not have the power that they have to be in spaces where they do not belong, especially mental health and, and, and the education system. Um, our community should have power and we should have power over our communities to, and to keep our communities safe. And I hope you all will stand with us and I hope you are hearing us and you all will continue this fight and journey with us. Fire Wayne Isaacs. Good morning, everyone. My name is Victor Dempsey. I'm also the brother of Darren Small. As my sister just stated, well, first I wanna thank the Public Safety Committee Chair Adrian Adams and members of the Public Safety for allowing us to give testimony today. As my sister said, we've been at city council numerous times. We're here again, once again, to discuss the urgent need for comprehensive change to public safety and policing in our city. We, along with other families, know too much about the NYPD and the lack of accountability and the daily violence they do in our lives every single day. As my sister said, Daron was killed in front of his girlfriend, stepdaughter, and four-month-old baby by Wayne Isaacs more than four and a half years ago. Isaacs rolled his window down falsely, shot my brother three times, and as Daron was dying in the street, Isaacs called 911 for himself. There's video recordings for that. He did not call 911 and say, there's a man dying in the street. He called for himself, falsely claiming he was attacked. He never even told 911 that he had shot someone who needed aid, and he didn't try to provide any aid himself. He literally let our brother die in the street. In the years since Daron was killed, we have gotten to know many other families, locally and nationally, that have faced the same struggles as us. The NYPD and the mayor used deliberate tactics to delay and block accountability to protect officers from the consequences of their wrongdoing. It's almost impossible to get an NYPD officer fired 
when they kill or brutalize black, Latino, or other people of color in the city, and that is wrong. But let's get to this piece. Last year when Governor Cuomo called for Mayor de Blasio and other leaders in the cities and towns throughout the state to reform policing, I was skeptical because I know personally the resistance of the mayors of standing up to NYPD. But I know, and the families that are here today know, the NYPD's power must be checked. I've been following the NYPD's process, responding to the governor's executive order, and I can tell you that it's false. Their community engagement has been a propaganda session for the NYPD. There is no real engagement. They're going to tell you that they've engaged with hundreds of thousands of people, but honestly, it's all fake. I know this because I was literally present in the audience, in the Facebook audience at five of those events. I too am a city worker. And even if it wasn't fake, the NYPD shouldn't be the ones running the process. The fact that the mayor has left them to do so is the reason, let alone why they can act with impunity. This executive order came down and asked for this for NYPD to work with community groups, stakeholders, the voices of the people, and that was not done. The process from the main NYPD has been largely happening behind closed doors with almost no transparency. We need to make a plain that we need to make it a plain that a process that is not that is being directed by NYPD, the same people who already refuse to do the bare minimum is a sham process. The mayor and the NYPD won't even serve the discipline charges against Wayne Isaacs that CCRB sent them months ago, literally last year. And there is no excuse for that. Our family hasn't even heard anything else about it. As a city council, we need you to be the people's voice. We need you to work with us, the families and the groups that we trust to make sure that people who killed our loved ones are fired. Families are the experts in this field. We are the ones fighting day in and day out, not sleeping, running out of bereavement time, running, sacrificing everything in our personal lives to seek justice, and not only justice, but also seeking accountability for not only our loved ones, but for the communities that we live in. So it doesn't happen to other families the way it's happened to us. I, like the other families, want to see Isaacs, want to see the officers who kill, brutalize, and disrespect our communities fired. We want to see the NYPD's power cut so they, can, so they can't run the city the way we, they've been doing. We need money moved from the NYPD to the crisis management system and violent interrupter groups and other needs so that we can have real safety in our city. I know this because again, I'm a city worker and I work directly with the Cure Violence sites and I see the work these men and women do day in and day out on the ground by making some change. We don't need more police in our communities. I hope you will work with us to make sure that Wayne Isis is fired and that as a city, we do some real thinking and create a public safety that isn't only about police. I know that's my time and I really, really appreciate it. Thank you again, uh, Councilmember Chair Adams for giving us the time for this testimony. I appreciate it. Um, Chair, do you have any questions? I do. Uh, be, before, uh, well, I, I don't really have any questions. Just, just a comment on the significance of hearing these families. You know, um, we did this this morning because things are typically done the opposite. We usually hear from the admin uh, and others, and then they have an opportunity to leave. And quite frankly, that has been uh, a sticking point for me as a council member um, for my term here. You know, I'm, I'm in my third year now and that's always been something that has bothered me about council hearings is that we don't have the folks that need to hear from the families from the public sticking around and hanging around and paying them the respect that they rightfully deserve so i just thought that that you know our our first uh, time time out today in this hearing myself chairing this committee that we would just start off on a bit of a different footing, especially given the subject matter. So to the families, my heart continues to go out for you. Uh, prior to becoming a council member, um, I was, <laughs> and, and still consider myself out there fighting the good fight. So we're going to do our best to get this done. And just know that I sincerely appreciate your time this morning. I carry your loved ones in my heart and sincerely feel sincerely, sincerely feel for your loss. We're going to continue to do this work together. Thank you so much for your testimony today.
And Chair, I believe we've been joined by a few council members. Would you like to- Yes, to yes, we we have been joined by council members Lander, Rodriguez, Gibson, Cabrera, Majority Leader Cumbo, council members Rose, Deutsch, Levin, Kuh, and Miller. Thank you. Next, we will hear from representatives of the administration. The panelists to give testimony will be the Chief Strategy Officer of the Office of the First Deputy Mayor, Chelsea Davis, Deputy Executive Assistant of the New York City Law Department, Thomas Giovanni, Chief of Staff of the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, Marco Soler, Chief of Patrol of the New York City Police Department, Juanita Holmes, Deputy Commissioner for Strategic Initiatives of the New York City Police Department, Danielle Pemberton, Deputy Commissioner for, of Community Partnerships for the New York City Police Department, Chauncey Parker, Executive Director for Strategic Initiatives of the New York City Police Department, Elizabeth Dates, and Managing Attorney of the Legislative Affairs Unit of the New York City Police Department, Michael Clark. Before we, will, before we begin testimony, I will administer the oath to all members of the administration who will be offering testimony or will be available for questions, please raise your right hands. I will read, read the oath and then call on each of you individually for a response. Please raise your right hands. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and respond, to, respond honestly to council member questions? Uh, Ms. Davis. Yes, I do. Mr. Giovanni. Thomas Giovanni. Yes. Um, Mr. Soler. Yes, I do. Uh, Chief Holmes. I do. Deputy Commissioner Pemberton. Deputy Commissioner Pemberton. Can you not hear us? I do. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Parker. Yes, I do. Um, Executive, uh, Ms. States. I do. And Mr. Clark. I do. Thank you all. Now I invite um, Ms. Davis to begin uh, the administration testimony. Good morning, Chair Adams, uh, council members, members of the Public Safety Committee. Um, I wanna start by thanking Ms. Baez, Ms. Ba, Mr. Feliz, uh, Ms. Davis, Mr. Dempsey for, for speaking this morning. Um, it's certainly an uh, um, understatement to say that I'm um, humbled and, and honored to speak after you. I really wanna thank you for sharing your, your experience and, and for all the work that you've done. Um, my name is Chelsea Davis, Chief Strategy Officer in the Office of the First Deputy Mayor. Um, I'm joined by Thomas Giovanni, a Deputy Executive Assistant from the Law Department, who's helping support the collaborative. Marco Soler, Chief of Staff from the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. I'm also joined by colleagues from the Police Department, Juanita Holmes, Chief of Patrol, Danielle Pemberton, Deputy Chief for Strategic Initiatives, Chauncey Parker, Deputy Commissioner for Community Partnerships, Elizabeth Dates, Executive Director of Strategic Initiatives, and Michael Clark, Managing Attorney of the Legislative Affairs Unit. Thank you for inviting us to discuss the important topic. Um, and we do um, certainly look forward to, to staying today for the duration of the hearing. Um, the mayor has seized the opportunity presented by Executive Order 203 to fully engage all communities in creating a shared vision of public safety and rebuilding mutual trust between police and the, and the people they serve. I'll provide a brief overview of the executive order, describe the framework of the Reform and Reinvention Collaborative Working Group under the leadership of the first deputy mayor, explain the city's engagement strategy and discuss themes that you're um, likely to see in the reform plan that will be posted for public comment. Um, all policy changes still under careful consideration and we'll be releasing the, the draft reform plan soon. I wanna begin that while, by saying that while Executive Order 203 outlines a process and timeline for developing and approving a reform plan um, for increasing community um, police relationships and reducing disparities in policing, we'll continue to work to ensure that policing reflects the needs of the communities we serve long past the April 1st deadline for this reform plan. The EO is an opportunity to focus on the most urgent and impactful policy changes in collaboration with community members and leaders police reform experts and justice advocates. Our mission must also be to set up permanent structures for ongoing reform that will last far past April 1st into future administrations and departments. 
We aim to continue finding ways to address longstanding policing concerns, concerns raised by communities that have historically borne the brunt of over-policing. We know that cannot happen overnight. The administration is committed to police reform um, more than seven years ago. We'll continue to seek and find ways to address um, concerns raised by communities most impacted by over-policing. We're equally committed to ensuring that NYPD recruits, retains, trains, and promotes diverse and resilient professionals who always reflect the values of the communities they serve. Finally, we recognize that public safety and quality of life in New York City is not the sole responsibility of the police department. We'll continue to find ways to allocate city resources appropriately across agencies to ensure that not every condition or crisis triggers a law enforcement response. Executive Order 203 requires every local government in New York State to create a police reform and reinvention collaborative. It was signed during a period of national and local unrest following a number of incidents with police that resulted in the recent deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, among too many others. The order which recognizes the long-standing and painful history of discrimination and mistreatment of communities of color in New York State also specifically lists some of the New Yorkers, including New York City residents who have been killed by police officers, Anthony Baez, Delon Small, Amadou Diallo, Usman Zhang, Sean Bell, Ramarli Graham, Patrick Derismond, Mohamed Ba, Alan Feliz, Akai Gurley, Eric Garner, an obviously incomplete list. The order directs police departments across the state to perform a comprehensive review of all current procedures and practices, as well as to consider creating new practices and structures entirely. The executive order directs local governments to adopt a policing reform plan by April 1st, 2021. The order directs the chief executive of such local government to convene the head of the local police agency and stakeholders in the community to develop a plan to adopt and implement the recommendations resulting from its review and consultation, including any modifications, modernizations, and innovations to policing deployments, strategies, policies, procedures, and practices tailored to the specific needs of the community and general promotion of imp improved police agency and community relationships based on trust, fairness, accountability, and transparency, which seek to reduce racial disparities in policing. On August 17th, 2020, the state published Resources and Guide for Public Officials and Citizens, a workbook to aid governments and communities with the reform and reinvention collaborative process and final product. The plan must be offered for public comment to all citizens, and then after consideration of such comments, presented to the local legislative body for adoption by April 1st, 2021. All of this work starts with meaningful community and stakeholder engagement. The city's reform and reinvention collaborative was convened by the first deputy mayor in partnership with the police commissioner as required by the executive order and includes leaders across city hall, the mayor's office of criminal justice, community affairs unit, legislative affairs unit, and the New York City law department, along with three extraordinary community leaders, Jennifer Jones Austin from the Federation of Protestant Welfare Agencies, Wes Moore from the Robin Hood Foundation, and Arva Rice from the New York Urban League. Let me take this opportunity to thank them for their time, commitment, hard work, and service to the city of New York. In the first phase of community engagement, the NYPD hosted eight open meetings across all patrol boroughs, plus one citywide multilingual meeting simultaneously translated into 10 languages. These meetings consisted of a brief presentation on recent policing reforms and an open dialogue facilitated by co-sponsors, community members, and leaders, including generous volunteers from the New York Peace Institute, Cure Violence Community, Center for Court Innovation, Youth Build Staten Island, Queens Bridge Tenants Association, and others. All these events um, and videos remain available on the NYPD YouTube channel. The collaborative also hosted um, a separate session to engage those from communities most impacted by policing, led by the initiative's co-sponsors. Um, these impacted uh, uh, for, for multiple meetings. Um, impacted communities were identified using uh, New York City Department of Health data on incarceration rates overlaid with community board boundaries and an aggregate of 311, 911, use of force, shooting incidents, shooting victims, and CCRB um, rates. Our co-sponsors, Jennifer Jones Austin, Arva Rice, and Wes Moore hosted meetings that encouraged and supported individuals who spoke candidly about their lived experiences often in economically disadvantaged communities of color in New York. 
During the second phase of the engagement strategy, the collaborative hosted an additional 32 meetings with external stakeholders, including community-based organizations, advocacy groups, clergy, racial justice advocates, cure violence providers, ethnic and religious organizations, nonprofits, LGBTQI community leaders, the deaf and hard of hearing community, tenants associations, shelter-based and affordable housing communities and providers, uh, people who are justice involved, crime victims, policy experts, prosecutors, oversight bodies, elected officials, and many others. In order to succeed, we understand that reform must happen with police rather than to them. To that end, the collaborative also hosted 13 meetings with uniform and civilian members of the NYPD. These meetings paralleled the impacted community meetings focused on members assigned to work in the same neighborhoods. Uniform and civilian members of all ranks, ages, races, genders, orientations, ethnic backgrounds, and assignments participated along with leaders from NYPD's police unions and 36 different fraternal organizations. The city recognizes that fulfilling the orders directive requires the creation of a plan that seeks to achieve several fundamentally important outcomes to eliminate unnecessary and excessive force, eliminate racially biased policing, to create policies that respect and reflect the perspectives of the most heavily policed communities, to apply principles of restorative justice and reconciliation to increase community trust, to address areas of police culture that act as impediments to the achievement of reform, and perhaps most importantly, to create new and permanent structures to achieve, monitor, and develop new and ongoing policy reforms through genuine community engagement and stakeholder engagement with NYPD. Achieving reforms in these areas, both um, as to outcomes and process, will result in a better, safer, more, more lawful environment for all New Yorkers, but most especially those in heavily impacted communities. The city has identified key parts of a reform agenda that can bring us closer to achieving our goals, leading us to develop a shared vision for public safety with all New Yorkers and address the needs identified in the executive order. Taken together, this framework offers a vision of policing in New York City that delivers better results for communities as well as members of the NYPD. One area with near universal support, including from members of the NYPD is improving the disciplinary process. The plan will ensure greater transparency, accountability, um, and discipline within NYPD, and the city will take long-term steps to ensure robust, consistent external oversight. We will also continue to work closely with local communities to implement a shared vision for service re response and public safety that includes law enforcement as a supportive partner, but does not force officers into roles that other service providers can satisfy more effectively. The plan will also focus on improving interactions between policing communities through culture change, policy change, and tactical change, such as implementing recommendations made by DOI and law after investigating this summer's protests. The collaborative is also exploring new robust programs that combat racial bias and create strong and lasting bonds between police and communities. Additionally, the city will provide New Yorkers with opportunities to give their feedback to the department in the development of both policy and training, a model that was imperative in the development of the agency's new disciplinary penalty guidelines, which will be published January 15th. All New Yorkers are critical stakeholders in how they are policed, and the NYPD is committed to including more voices in all manners of processes that were previously internal to the department. Finally, the city is committed to greater diversity, equity, and inclusion throughout NYPD, and will support members of service with the, the tools they need to promote mental health and safety as a means toward resiliency and improving officer performance. Before closing, I must note that at every public event so far held, the single most common word used by community members as well as police is respect. While not a policy itself, concepts of respect can and will be infused into measurable policies and practices. We must do this. We look forward to coming back to council after the draft plan is published for, uh, for feedback from members and from the public. This process is iterative, collaborative, and ongoing. We're confident that this framework reflects what is being voiced by community members and demanded by these times. But at the same time, we recognize that large scale policing reform is a long term, multi layered, evolving commitment that requires flexibility and requires continuous communication. We're fully committed to this process. We look forward to future conversations with the council and working with you to create a plan that will make our city safer and more equitable for generations to come. Thank you, and my colleagues and I are, are now happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. 
I will now turn it over to uh, Chair Adams for questions. Panelists from the administration, please stay unmuted as if possible during this question and answer period. Um, a reminder to Chair Adams, you'll be in, in control of muting and unmuting yourself during this period. Thank you and Chair, you may begin. Thank you, uh, Council. Uh, before we go on, I just want to uh, note that uh, we're aware that there have been technical difficulties this morning um, with, this, uh, with this live stream. So we just want folks to know my office has received phone calls. We're trusting that everything is back in order. We were told that the screen went blank for a little while. So just want to make sure that we're up and running and everything is streaming properly at this time. Uh, yes, Chair Adams, we are in room one now, and we will make sure to have the video up as soon as the hearing is over. The full Terrific. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Not a problem. We've uh, also been joined by Council Member Brannon. So with that, uh, Ms. Davis, thank you very much for your testimony this morning. It's good to have you here. <clears throat> I do have questions. Um, and this really would be for anyone testifying on the administrative side of the house. Can any of you say whether or not you've read the state's guidance on the collaborative? Yes, thank you for that question. Um, we've absolutely read obviously the executive order and the state's guidance um, on the collaborative. We believe that the, the uh, collaborative so far, the plan we have in place for engagement, for engaging as many stakeholders as possible, accepting all recommendations um, and publishing a plan um, you know, in the coming weeks for public comment um, before bringing it to, to council uh, for ratification um, on or before April 1st reflects um, what we've read in the, in the executive order and in the guidance. Uh, okay, so that said, um, I, I guess I'd like to know why the city's not following the suggested timeline or the transparency guidelines and the guidance then. Sure, so in, in terms of the, the timeline, um, we um, absolutely understand the, the urgency of um, creating this plan. Um, I believe we've reached out to um, many members of council to, to have meetings and hear as much feedback as possible. Um, however, we are not looking at this effort as just something that's going to be completed by April 1st. Our goal is to make sure that what we're doing is creating um, permanent structures for meaningful engagement. Um, and that in and of itself is a key reform. So um, even if some of the, the milestones, which I'm happy to talk more specifically about, don't align exactly with the guidelines, um, we're very committed to, to this process um, and to making sure that there is enough time for full engagement and public comment before any plan is decided on. Okay, well, what oh. or, or agency is actually responsible for drafting the plan? Has, has it even started yet? Sure, so this effort is being led by the first deputy mayor um, in collaboration with the police department, the mayor's office of criminal justice and many other stakeholders in city hall. Um, the, the mayor's office will be um, uh, presenting the plan in collaboration um, with the co-sponsors, Jennifer Jones Austin, Arbor Rice and Wes Moore um, for public comment soon. The first deputy mayor's office is the one directed to uh, be responsible for the contents of the plan that is put before you. Okay, so it is the first deputy mayor's office. That's it, right. It, the executive office, the executive order directs the mayor to come up with this plan, and then the first, the mayor has directed the first deputy mayor to be responsible to come up with the content of the plan that will be submitted to the council. Has any content started yet? Has have, have anything started on the ground floor as far as content? So we are working very diligently to come up with the plan that can be shared for public comment. Um, we um, have absolutely started um, to think through what policies um, and what kinds of structures are appropriate for the framework that we put forward. Um, fundamentally, our plan will center around the need to create um, a public safety system that fosters a safe and equitable environment for all New Yorkers. Um, and we'll focus on mechanisms for transparency for um, accountability at the individual level and at the systemic level, um, as well as culture change. Um, I will also add that we are going to be um, putting up 
a website that will be dedicated to this process that will um, detail a lot of the meetings that we can talk through today, um, as well as um, it will, where, will be where you can find the link to the public report. Um, currently, um, NYPD posts um, a very significant amount of data on their website um, and through their um, website and their YouTube channel, you can, um, you can access um, many of the, the public meetings that were had for this process. Oh, okay, but so the timeline says that you should have already identified measurable goals by now. Have you done that? Yes, as I said in my uh, my test my testimony, um, we have um, identified major goals um, for for reform. I'm happy to to reiterate those. Our Can you give us some examples? Sure. Our, our major goals are the elimination of excessive and unnecessary force, the elimination of racially biased policing. Uh, a policing culture that reflects and promotes the values of New York City, um, policing that's transparent and holds officers accountable um, in a manner that's swift, consistent, and fair um, at the individual officer level and the, the level of the department, the systemic level. Um, we're committed to, um, as part of this process, developing robust, independent oversight of policing. Um, of creating regular, respectful, and productive uh, engagements with communities um, and permanent structures for those engagements that will last far, far past the April 1st deadline. Um, our goal is to create policing responses that are calibrated to having the lightest touch necessary to maintain safety. Um, and a department that, that supports officers with the training tools and resources that they need. Um, but also, as I said in the testimony, um, our main goal is to make sure that all of our communication and engagement is infused with trusting communities and in respecting and privileging the, the experiences and the um, voices of people who've been impacted by over-policing and racially biased policing in New York City. Okay, so, so you're, you're talking a lot about collaboration now. Mm -hmm. So can you provide us with a list of all of the stakeholders you've had meetings with so far? Um, I absolutely can follow up with a, like a detailed list of all of the stakeholders that we have met with so far. Um, the list has included hundreds of organizations um, and individuals. Um, it includes policy experts, community groups, um, impacted community members, members of service, oversight agencies, clergy members. Um, I'm happy to follow up with a, with a detailed list of, of who we've spoken to individually and, and who's been representing what organizations. Are you also working with the DA's offices? Have they given you any recommendations? We are. Um, the collaborative hosted a meeting with all of the district attorney's offices to get their recommendations for this process. Um, I'll also add that um, the mayor's office of criminal justice obviously has very regular communication and engagement with all criminal justice stakeholders, including the district attorneys. Um, and I'll allow Marcos Soler from the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice to speak to what that engagement has been like as well. Thank you, Chelsea. Our office regularly has stand with many other reforms, whether it's close rifles or other initiatives meet regularly with all institutions in the city. Obviously, the DA's office is one of them. Uh, we have also met in the past with uh, members of the defense bar and certainly with a lot of community organizations, CMS groups, et cetera, then we work regularly. Are you working with any outside experts or consultants? Okay. Okay. Uh, so we are working very closely with the three co-sponsors, Jennifer Jones, Austin, Arva Rice, and Wes Moore. Um, and I will, um, as a leader and co-facilitator of many of the stakeholder meetings, uh, I will leave it to Deputy Commissioner Parker um, to talk through some of our other partners and some of our other um, in engagement strategies and, and to talk a little bit about the uh, major content of what we've heard so far from these meetings. <clears throat> what about the federal monitor from, uh, from the stop and frisk case? The collaborative has, um, has had a meeting with the federal monitor focused on recommendations for um, for this uh, plan as well. Okay, uh, I'm going to shift gears just a little bit before I, I get uh, my colleagues uh, into this. I just want to start talking about leadership. Um, 
if we don't have leaders that are committed to reform, then none of this is, this is really worth our time, All right? So I, I just wanna read a couple of sentences from DOI's recent report on how the NYPD handled the protest last summer. Quote, whereas NYPD officials acknowledged shortcomings in its initial deployments, the majority of NYPD officials interviewed by DOI did not otherwise identify any flaws in the department's planning or performance. When DOI asked NYPD officials whether, in, retro in retrospect, the department could have done anything else differently and made any further changes to improve its response to the protests, with few exceptions, officials offered none, quote, end quote. DOI also said that some police de department officials claim they didn't see a single officer covering their badge number and that every officer was wearing a mask. So first, I'd like to ask the mayor's office, have you discussed what the DOI reported? I'm not just talking about their recommendations. That NYPD officials didn't think the protest should be handled any differently and they actually lied about masks and, ba and badge coverings. Does that concern you? Um, we're very grateful to the to DOI for their report. I think the mayor has been clear that we um, are accepting all of the recommendations and part of this plan will be um, creating implementation plans for those recommendations. Um, he's also clear that um, we're grateful um, and accept all the findings of the report. Um, and I believe he, he also has said that um, there were certainly things that he wished um, everyone had done differently. Um, I believe that report was thoughtful and well done um, and well documented. Um, and I think those uh, many significant recommendations, we are really looking forward to building plans to implement, including the plan to consolidate independent um, external oversight, which we believe will have really positive implications for um, accountability. Um, I will um, leave it to the police department to talk through um, their leadership and their um, department's commitment to, to implementing these recommendations and how uh, to speak to how seriously we take these findings as well. But do you think that it's a problem that some officials are refusing to acknowledge that anything went wrong at all? I think that, yes, the mayor and, and we're, we are clear that um, we accept the findings of, of that report and are absolutely committed to making sure that improving accountability is part of this plan. Um, we absolutely need that accountability to create mutual trust between police and communities. The core function of PD is to protect and serve the public and to be able to do both effectively. Officers have to have the trust of the communities where they work. Um, so, so Ms. Davis, can leaders who refuse to acknowledge mistakes help to implement real change? Something that we have heard over and over again through almost every community meeting that we have done is that in order to build trust, in order to, to move forward and have real accountability, it's absolutely essential to acknowledge harm that's been done. That's why one of our explicit goals is to move forward and have um, you know, continue engagement um, based on the principles of restorative justice and reconciliation, which absolutely requires um, that acknowledgement of, of past harm is done. And that's essential for, for the, the accountability that we're talking about and for building trust. And okay, but, but you know, we're, we're trying to really peel back, you know, the, the layers of this onion and, and, and to be as, as forthcoming and truthful as possible um, when it comes to um, uh, complying with this executive order. So in, in all actuality, it looks like, like the mayor is letting NYPD take lead here. That's what it looks like. Do you think that an agency should be in charge of reforming itself? You think that's possible? Um, I absolutely don't think that's possible, but I want to reiterate um, that the Reform and Reinvention Collaborative is led by First Deputy Mayor Fe uh, Dean Foulihan. Um, we are partnering with um, Mayor's Council, with Intergovernmental Affairs, with many other partners within City Hall, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, um, our Community Affairs Unit, and the NYPD as dictated by the executive order. 
We also see Jennifer Jones Austin, Arbor Rice and Wes leaders um, and really thank them for their leadership here as well. Um, I think that uh, police department are key partners in reform, especially as we have heard from so many members of service that they have very similar feedback um, as many community members, especially in terms of the need for, for reforming and improving the disciplinary process. So um, as I said in my testimony, we have to make sure that um, police reform is something that we do with officers and not to them, but I absolutely agree that a reform process should not be led by the agency we're reforming. And this um, this reform process, the Reform and Reinvention Collaborative, is being led by um, by the mayor and by First Deputy Mayor Dean Foulihan. Um, uh, also, uh, also I, I would like to add that this process is not only iterative and, and an evolving process for the city, it's one for us as well. And we understand the perspective that people have about the, uh, the beginnings of this process and why they feel what they feel about the the composition and the nature of the meetings earlier on. But I would, I would suggest that we continue to look at the process, look at the more recent meetings and look at the inertia and energy that has been developed as this process has grown and we've learned even more about how to engage. Uh, I think you will see a difference between the early engagement and the recent engagement. And again, you're hearing from the administration about our continued commitment to new engagement. Uh, there is uh, no aspect of this that I wanna suggest is gaslighting in the sense that what people perceived wasn't real. What they perceive is real and we reacted to it by changing the way of our engagement. We will continue to adjust our engagement uh, based upon what we hear from community members. Respectfully, and, and thank you for that, uh, res respectfully, it was NYPD that actually announced this, rolled this out. And uh, basically, why, did, uh, why ha has the NYPD hosted all the meetings so far? I mean, perception. Well, they haven't actually to be, they have been the vehicle to engage the community first, uh, the structure, but they have not actually controlled or led the meetings in that sense. Part of this uh, endeavor, especially in the listening sessions though, is to actually hear from the communities that were harmed. And it would be inappropriate, I think, to interpose another person or another entity in between the police uh, and those community members. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Parker, has actually had to sit and actually engage with that negative uh, community voice that has been out there in a way that would not have happened if police weren't central to this activity. They do need to be in the room. They do need to be uh, hearing the information and directly from community members. You're co very correct, as, as Chelsea has already said, they do not need to be in total control of this process and they are not, but they should be first and foremost to hear from the community about what was done and about what needs to be done. So in that sense, we do need to perhaps calibrate how this is being received, but they should be there and they should be at the forefront of this as they were at the forefront of the events in the, uh, that have led us to this. So I, I think there's a parallel here that has to be respected for them. They, they do belong in the front. I'll also well, add that we are extremely grateful for the feedback that we got from the community after the first eight listening sessions that we yes. described. We really tried to make as many, create as many different kinds of forums as possible. Um, and again, hear as much as possible from people who are from communities that have borne the brunt of over policing and racially biased policing in the city. Um, I do think it would be helpful to hear from Deputy Commissioner Parker about yeah. um, the meetings that he has co-facilitated um, and, and a lot of the feedback that he's heard from the community. So, so with, with, I'm sorry. I was, I was going to say with that, with that great introduction, <laughs> with uh, Deputy Parker, would you like to, would you like to chime in? Because I've got some questions for NYPD, but before I, before I go there, do you have any remarks this far? Um, yes, sure. I, mean, I um, would say this, that um, after the murder of George Floyd um, at the end of May, um, and the governor's executive order in June, on June 12th, the guidance came out on August 17th. And from our perspective, from the police commissioner down within the police department and the mayor's office, is that we are doing everything we can to seize this opportunity to hear as many voices as possible to take um, really a giant swing for what we can do to reimagine public safety. I can tell you what we've done. We're just, we're the NYPD and the effort that we've made. You're, I'm sure you're aware of the town hall was the first step that was on, started on October 14th that Chief Holmes led together with our co-sponsors to try to go far and wide within the city to at least 
start the conversation of getting community feedback. But we've heard from our co-sponsors, we've heard from um, from our leaders. The most important thing for the police department in particular is to be listening. And so we've gone to lots of different groups, but give you an example of how it sort of has, has, has gone. Um, a conversation I had with um, Fred Davey and the CCRB and, and um, some faith leaders, they said, you know, I think it would be really important for the police department to hear voices of young people. Um, and so at their, would they be, would you be willing to do that? And so that was one of the, one of the conversations that we've had was a conversation with the CCRB Youth Council, um, which was Chief Madrin. I think it was a two hour conversation with about 20 young people who were part of or were affiliated with the CCRB Youth Council. Um, and then that led, that was a very productive, very pointed, very focused conversation where we listened to what the young people had to say, particularly their criticisms of the police department and their ideas for how we could do better. That then led to a town hall that the CCRB Youth Council put together that invited young voices from across the city. I think there were 200 young people on the call, but on all these calls, on that call, and I'll tell you about some of the others, it's always been we want to bring the voice, voice to the table to hear what they have to say for how we, how we, how we can do better. We don't control who, who, whoever they want to bring to that, 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 that group, whatever it may be, whether it's CCRB or the NAACP or anyone else. It's always been you bring the people to the voice we want to listen and we want to hear specifically how we can, we can do better, both as a, as specifically as a police department, but also as a city um, to protect and serve New Yorkers. Our meetings have ranged from, we met with New York uh, Reform NYPD Now, which is um, a group of 60 um, top community-based organizations from across the city that are dedicated and have a you know, heart and soul in their effort and, uh, is in protecting and, and helping and serving New Yorkers across the city. And they came to, um, to us with very specific ideas about how the police department can, can do better. And we went through them. In fact, the police commissioner met with them and went through item by item of each one of their, their suggestions. So that was one of the conversations. We met with the leadership with Dr. Jutes and the leadership of, um, of the NAACP um, and her branch leaders, very specific, and that was with the police commissioner, very specifically their ideas for what the police department and what the city needs to do. Yeah, okay, follow that up with follow-up um, recommendations from their legislative council, um, Ken Cullen and, and Devon Fire, that are followed up with, uh, with very specific suggestions for what we need to do on the path forward. We've met with um, men who are working at this, the Columbia Center for Justice, who are people who have come home from prison, are now uh, professors, teachers at, at uh, uh, as part of uh, as part of that initiative to talk very specifically about their their experience. A lot of these are hard shoots of, of uh, bad experiences, very bad experiences they've had within their life with police officers. But also, always, I would say, seeing through every conversation, I've probably had fifty of them with uh, with our partners in the mayor's office and with our uh, with our co-sponsors. Every conversation I've had um, has. Uh, has has been a constant theme has been how much New Yorkers crave this conversation. If it's gonna be real and we're really gonna talk about it, that they're coming to the table with very specific ideas and leaning into this this conversation. The three things that I heard in my it really reflect um, very much um, the the message, the passionate message of, of our first five speakers and I'm so sorry for for their losses of, of their son, their brother. Um, but it's one is accountability. It's not that it's, they want accountability within the police department. They just want a system that's fair, that's clear, that's transparent, that people can believe it. That's the one, accountability is number one. Number two is that people in the community want to be treated with exceptional customer service, almost like it was the Apple store or the, anywhere else, but how people, how police officers engage with young, with, with people, for example, with young people are saying, we want to have, we want to see the police in something other than before responding to some 911 call, but there are other ways that the police department can engage. Can you participate in creating opportunities for young people? Communities want to be part of transition plans with community, uh, with precinct commanders. They're there one day, then they're in another precinct the next day. They build up these relationships. But it goes far and wide, very specific with the bottom line, the second theme that I hear and measure that is, is customer service. And then the third is what you what you referenced and, and our early speakers referenced is really kind of creating a shared vision together with the community for public safety. What really should be the responsibility of the police department when it comes to 
uh, people suffering from mental illness, people, the, the people who are homeless, with people who are suffering from a, from a substance use disorder, schools, safety in our schools, traffic, all those are questions, but they, what we've heard in you know, lots of different perspectives, ranging from people who have had very bad experiences. We've also had conversations, for example, with the Greater Harlem um, uh, group uh, coalition that is very, very frustrated, I think, as you may know, and others know, very frustrated with the, uh, with um, with how the city, all city agencies are responding to challenges that they face in their kids. We've met with Harlem Mother Safe, and we've met with the parents of people who have lost their children um, to gun violence. We, we, what we've done is the best we possibly can to hear as many voices as we possibly can. There's nobody that we haven't said, except a schedule of all who wants to talk to us. We're working as fast as we can, but at the end, the poll will be in whether we're bold or not, right? That will be what we're doing. But I can tell you from, from our team with the first deputy mayor's office and the police department, we've dropped everything that we're doing basically to take advantage of this opportunity because that's what the police commissioner and specifically to me and our team and mayor have told us this isn't a burden, this executive order, this is an opportunity. We're in a historic moment in time right now. And we're either gonna swing to the fences or we're not, but we are gonna take advantage of it. And so that's what all of us have done the very best we could do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And, and that was like, and, and, and I'm asking this because I know that again, NYPD has taken the lead and, and I'm not questioning the work that you've done thus far, but we, this is a collaborative effort for reform. And it sounds like you, you're, you're doing your due diligence as far as the NYPD is concerned. And that's, that's, that's appreciated. We're trying to bring together the entire collaborative to make this happen for the people of the city of New York and to meet this executive order. So we're six months into a nine month process. And really it, it sounds like the only agency that's held a listening session is the NYPD. Can we hear some engagement, uh, some more engagement? What about the Department of Homeless Services, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, the Department of Education, some of those very agencies that we've heard the families talk about this morning when they're talking about defunding and where the money and the budget dollars in their estimation should be reallocated. So where are those listening sessions? Where have those talks gone? Um, what, what, how many meetings has the admin had with other agencies that should be involved as a part of this important collaborative to make this reform happen and to meet this objective? Sure, thank, thank you for that question. Um, I'm, I'm grateful to be able to, to clarify sort of um, the meetings that we've had so far um, and, and what leadership looks like. Um, we're extremely grateful for Deputy Commissioner Parker's um, e e extremely um, honest facilitation of many of these meetings. All of the meetings that we have described so far, um, well over 50 meetings with hundreds of organizations and individuals have been hosted by the whole collaborative, which again is led by First Deputy Mayor Dean Foulihan. Um, many of the meetings um, are facilitated by Deputy Commissioner Parker and our co-sponsors, um, but we are all um, leading those meetings. We are all directly hearing the feedback um, and following up. Additionally, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice has very, very regular contact with all criminal justice stakeholders, um, policy experts, policing experts, policing advocates, Kits, um, and and they can Marcos can can speak more to their engagement as well. Um, I will also add to your point that rethinking the role of police, understanding um, that we need to right size um, the police force, right size what functions they do and what they don't has is a key part of of this plan um, and will be a, a through line of many of the the recommendations and the plans that we hope to implement um, and that we hope to publish in the draft report. Um, we are certainly working with DHS, uh, the Department of Homeless Services, on um, implementing the commitment over the summer to transfer um, all um, homeless services and outreach away from the police department. Um, we also work very closely with Thrive, particularly in making sure um, that we can effectively implement and ev eventually expand programs um, to ensure that mental health crises are um, get the response that they deserve um, from a health perspective and not a law enforcement perspective. Um, so I'm happy to, to talk through um, other meetings that we're having. Um, we're also meeting with the um, uh, 
uh, runaway youth and homeless um, services providers to make sure um, that we are addressing needs um, through non-law enforcement mechanisms outside the criminal justice system so we don't criminalize um, poverty and so we don't criminalize homelessness um, and that we respond to health crises appropriately. Um, Marcos, do you have anything to add about the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice's um, leadership on engagement with criminal justice stakeholders? I would simply add two things. One is from the beginning of the administration uh, in our role in for writing policy advice to the mayor and to the first deputy mayor we have been a strong advocates for the position that we need to reduce the footprint of the criminal justice system in the city of New York. And as a result of that, we have engaged very widely with all groups in order to advocate from a police-centric vision of public safety to a community-centric vision of public safety. That is something that we did from the beginning and we have not changed. And this process just has exacerbated. So that has allowed us to connect, we stated, I stated before, the DAs, the defenders, in some instances, people have come to the table. Some instances, after coming to the table, they have decided to take different steps. And we understand that, but we have communicated with multiple city agencies. We have certainly talked to, as I said before, to a lot of our partners in the community, whether it's CMS groups, whether it's groups in reentry organizations. And our work in this work of changing the criminal justice system every day. The second is a, to state the point, and Chelsea has stated before very clearly, our role is to, a, in this process is to support to the people who are leading, in this case, is the first deputy mayor office on behalf of the mayor. And certainly, a, that's the way we see it. We do not, a, we, a, this process is not driven by the police department. This process is driven by the mayor and the first deputy mayor. And I can attest to that, and I can assure you that's the approach we certainly are taking in our office. I'll also add um, a few other agencies that we are meeting with regularly, including MOPD um, and NGBV, the Office to End Domestic and uh, Gender-Based Violence. And part of this plan will also be um, implementing recommendations um, to uh, take, uh, to address family violence and gender-based violence outside of the criminal justice system, um, as well as to create permanent structures for working um, with community members and organizations with direct lived experience. Um, there uh, was also a, a program implemented in Brownsville uh, recently that I think speaks to a lot of what you're talking about, um, about the need to build a shared vision of public safety through um, providing services um, as opposed to criminalization. Um, so I would love if um, the police department and the mayor's office of criminal justice can talk a little bit more about, um, about that program, um, which the mayor has said um, already that we are certainly looking to expand citywide all programs that can re-envision public safety, um, utilizing as much service provision as possible. Um, but before that, I will also just quickly reiterate that this process is absolutely not over and will not be over when we um, publish this uh, plan and start to implement it on April 1st. Um, we would love for, um, for, um, for you um, or any council members to provide um, more um, recommendations or, or to, to give us more um, ideas of people who should be meeting with from your constituents, organizations. Um, we are continually looking to set up new avenues of, of real engagement um, and to create neighborhood-based systems for increasing trust. Ms. Davis, were you talking about the pilot program in Brownsville? Yes, I was. Um, I think that it's a, a good example of, of the kinds of um, strategies that you're alluding to um, that utilize um, community-based organizations and other city agencies to provide services in order to create um, kind of public safety that's dictated um, by the by the community as opposed to dictated by the police. Um, I, I would like to hear the NYPD talk about that uh, pilot program. Um, expound on that uh, a little bit. Um, it, it, in, in an article, the mayor said that that it had his full support. Um, I'd like to know if uh, the NYPD fully supports it. And um, if so, uh, when can we expect the next one? So Chief Holmes, did you want to speak to that? Yes, good morning, how are good you? Good morning. Good, good, good. So good morning and thank you for the opportunity to address uh, what took place in Brownsville community. Since office in October, in the position of Chief of Patrol, 
I distributed a memo to all PSB commands, um, pretty much an operational strategy consisting of five pillars, one of which challenges each commander to reimagining, to reimagining neighborhood policing by developing creative ways to engage the community. With that, um, I have the pleasure of saying that Deputy Inspector Terrell Anderson, who's commanding officer of the 73 precinct, did just that. Um, how did he do that? We try and think of this as a community solution, working with the community together. Um, he pretty much had one of the TA presidents um, assigned to Van Dyke Houses, challenged him as what, you know, what could it be done about a two block radius that believe it or not was not really on our radar. There weren't many 311 calls there. There weren't many 911 calls there. So, but still the area still seemed to the community to be very seedy looking and required some services. Um, it is surrounded by some of our um, de developments there that have some violence. So with that, there were some police deployment, but strictly to address the violence. What he did was go to the table with one community-based organization called BIVO, Brownsville in, violence out, um, as well as New York City sanitation, because there were a lot of garbage or you know sanitary issues that needed to be addressed as well. And they sat down to the table and BIVO agreed to being deployed in that particular two block uh, radius for 10 hours a day from 12 noon to 10 p.m. In addition to that, it was probably about a total of 32 other service providers, not at the same time, but throughout the five day span that they were deployed there. So if they ran into someone in the community that required a particular services, as far as homelessness or job opportunities, they were there to um, kind of guide them and lead them over into the direction of these other um, other uh, community-based organizations that were assisting with this. Um, so they looked at it for five days and based on some of the surveys that were given out in the community, including the business owners that were pulled into this, um, people liked it. Uh, the area was clean uh, several times throughout the week by sanitation. So therefore just cleanliness itself gives this different appearance. Um, but with that, that's um, exactly what I was asking the commanders to do. Um, and we will continue that, but on a bigger level. And naturally, because of the diversity of New York City, it will look different in different communities. But with focus on our black and brown communities and definitely strengthening the relationship, trying to reestablish the faith and trust in their police department, we're definitely focused more in those communities with this community uh, solution um, philosophy. Um, and that's just identifying matters of the community with the community. What is it like? I heard uh, Commissioner Parker speak about, I think it's the Greater Harlem Initiative. We had a phone call with them and they spoke about the parents in the area with the methadone clinic and the homeless. Um, certain issues encompassing the 25 and 28 precinct that we spoke with Councilwoman um, Ana uh, Ayala, Anila, I think it is. Ayala. Yellow, thank you, uh, that we spoke with her about that we've been addressing. So those are some of our focuses, just taking the, trying to prioritize and taking the primary issues in each community and having this command roster re-enhanced because we always had it where we had numbers and, and contacts for key stakeholders in the community to address whatever issues need to be addressed. And now bringing everybody to the table Cure violence, um, sanitation, homeless, everyone plays a role. And then determining who should take the lead on whatever particular issue that's being met with. So that's something that was pushed out. I came, I started in October, like I said, the end of October. I pushed that out within a two week span. Um, and now we're going to capitalize off of that. And uh, I know we have, uh, we had one meeting with Brooklyn North, because naturally Brooklyn North and the Bronx has drove a lot of the violence in the city as far as gun violence is concerned. So we're definitely focused there, but also keeping our foot to the pedal in communities such as Harlem. So that, that sounds very positive. So when can we expect the next one? So the next one has begun in Brooklyn North already. And um, you know, we, I, we had a meeting last Thursday, I think with the commanders and the um, a borough commander, Judith Harrison. So they are currently now identifying their key areas of each of the Brooklyn North commands and 
developing that type of um, relationship or partnership with key stakeholders, and hopefully to be implemented by the beginning of next week. Um, we have a, and we will be monitoring that as well. Um, you know, managing it, ensuring that it's working, and if it's not, going back to the drawing board. What can we be doing differently? Uh, but, but I like it. I love it. I think it brings everyone um, into play because everyone has an onus uh, to keep in the city safe. And ex I agree. Expanding, expanding these kinds of partnerships and programs citywide um, will also absolutely be a key part of the of our reform plan. Um, I think the city's crisis management system and cure violence providers are such an essential partner for doing that work at the local neighborhood community level and figuring out what public safety means and what's required um, of that specific community. Um, so Marcos, can you speak more to the um, kind of neighborhood level work being done with cure violence providers? Absolutely, as you know, Madam Chair, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice houses the Office of Neighborhood Safety that includes both the Office to Bring on Violence and the Mayor's Action Plan for Neighborhood Safety, both of them our community-centric approaches to uh, problems of gun violence and crime. As you know, the mayor from the beginning of the administration has supported very strongly uh, the expansion of the program. The program that started with two or three sites right now is included in about 20 different uh, prisons in the city and continues to expand with additional support from the mayor for FY21 and FY22, even in the very difficult circumstances. This is also part of the points of agreement and it's our commitment, as it has been from the beginning of the administration, to continue the expansion of the model, a model that, as the chief highlighted, as Shields Holmes highlighted, demands and requires a level of internal cooperation and trust between the police department and, obviously, members of the community. It's a model in which we know works better. No one, one works separate from the other, but one, one and the other are supporting each other. That's also what our numbers suggest in terms of outcomes in terms of evaluations, we see that is both generating a uh, greater reductions in crime, but also in addition to that generating greater levels of community trust. And part of that again, is that there is no exclusion here. There is no one person leads, but rather is a very community centric approach to make sure that we are both working together, community and the police department and the criminal justice system and the city as a whole in order to change the way the infrastructure of our neighbors, the human capital, uh, the social infrastructure, and obviously address some of the underlying problems that we have seen and experienced for too long. We will continue to do this work and it will be central to our reform work. You will see that in the plan that we will submit. Okay, thank you. I, I, I agree. I think it's very important um, to continue to strengthen the relationships between NYPD and the crisis management um, system um, much tighter than it is. Um, we've got work to do in that arena because I, I think a lot of us will agree that um, the violence interrupters hold a very, very key role um, in our communities. And they, they are the glue really between the police and the community. So um, that said, uh, Chief Holmes mentioned, mentioned diversity. So I, I'm gonna ask this and then I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues. Um, I, you know, there, there is definitely uh, a diversity issue that has to be addressed when we look at police reform. We see that leadership is predominantly white. While we see that the ranks are people of color. So how much outreach uh, are we doing to officers of color with regard to this reform process, especially those that are not in leadership and what have their responses been? Because I can tell you feedback that I have received from the rank and file is a total disconnect from leadership. Some officers feel, officers of color, black and brown officers, feel that they're not heard, they're not respected, and they feel that their own union does not represent them. So how are we re uh, really, really, really addressing the issue of race in the NYPD? 
improving diversity, equity, and inclusion in recruitment, in retention, and promotion will absolutely be a major goal um, of, of this reform effort. Um, I will um, leave it to the police department to talk through not only uh, the engagement with officers that they've done um, as part of this as part of this plan, but the ways um, in which we're dedicated to making that um, a much more a much more permanent mechanism for continuing to get this feedback and meet the goals that I think diversity, equity, and inclusion in this context um, are, are for, which is representing communities, respecting communities that we serve, um, and and certainly um, improving um, the way that that police interact with with um, with all members of the public. NYPD, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, uh, good morning, uh, Chairperson Adams and members of the City Council and members of the public that have joined us today. My name is Liz Dates, I'm the Executive Director of Strategic Initiative for the NYPD. The collaborative led by Robin Hood and uh, the Deputy Commissioner of Equity and Inclusion here at NYPD hosted 13 meetings with uniform and civilian members of the NYPD, uh, covering all ranks, ages, races, genders, orientations, ethnic backgrounds, and assignments. More than 256 members participated in those open listening sessions where matters of equity, inclusion, diversity, transparency in both the disciplinary and promotion process, as well as resiliency, were thoroughly discussed. I can also say that you are correct, ma'am, that union leadership is not the only leadership in the NYPD. We did engage with all 36 fraternal organizations, which represent um, a myriad ethnicities and religious groups here in NYPD to get their take on uh, better leveraging the diversity of the uh, ranks and roles in this organization to build bridges with the communities that we serve. I can also say that we distributed a survey to our employees, uniform and civilian. We've received over 4,000 responses to date. And uh, as everyone I think who has spoken thus far has reiterated, we intend to use this process to build a framework for continuing engagement with all of our members rather than through the traditional chain of command channels alone. Our members are critical stakeholders in this process and we continue to engage with them on all matters of concern to the department. Okay, thank you. Uh, before I turn it over to my colleagues, uh, one uh, note, and I'll probably come back for our second round. Uh, last month, uh, a former council member, Richie Torres and I held a joint hearing on racial bias. The subject matter was the investigation of James Coble, AKA Clouseau. I want to know whether or not he's been fired. Uh, uh, Inspector Coble has not been fired yet, but he was suspended without pay last week um, as the disciplinary process uh, is ongoing. Um, but that was the next step is he's been suspended without pay. I also really want to thank you for that question um, and to, to thank you and your colleagues for holding that hearing. Um, an explicit goal of this reform plan is, of course, eliminating racially biased policing. Um, and to accomplish this, we are committed to improving preventative efforts, early intervention, and of course, um, true accountability. Um, and that's going to be a major, a major part of this plan. And we look forward to talking more about that. I think we really ought to uh, take a look at, um, well, well, obviously, a lot of things in reform. But one of the things that especially uh, gets me is that it appears very little consequences for bad behavior. Again, as heard by these families this morning. Again, as heard by these families that still have no justice for dead relatives. There has got to be accountability for bad behavior, not suspension, not pay, firing, and or prosecution. That said, I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues for questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I will now call on council members in the order that they have used the Zoom uh, raise hand function. If you'd like to ask a question and you have not yet used the Zoom raise hand function, please do so now. Council members, you have a total of three minutes to ask your questions and receive an answer from the panelists. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and will let you know when your time is up. 
when I call on you, please wait until the sergeant has announced, announced you may begin before asking your questions. Uh, the first three council members will be Menchaca, followed by Lander and Riley. Time starts now. Councilmember Menchaca. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to the chair uh, and the administration. Uh, I'm just curious that the kind of the main folks that have been presenting today uh, have been the administration on the mayor, the deputy mayor side, uh, and not the NYPD, uh, including Commissioner Shea uh, himself. And so is there a quick response to, to why he's not here representing since the NYPD has been the focus of this whole operation and the conversation that we're having today? I'll ask PD to, to answer the question about the police commissioner, but I'll just add that um, I'm here today um, as a representative of First Deputy Mayor Dean Foulihan, who's leading this collaborative um, with my colleagues, Thomas Giovanni, um, as well as Marco Soler from the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Um, but I'll ask my colleagues at PD to respond to your questions about the police commissioner. Hi, good morning, everyone. So uh, as you probably heard, the police commissioner has positive COVID-19. So he's at home, he's resting, and uh, he's looking forward to getting back to the office now, but he's entrusted us, uh, the deputy commissioners and others in this room, to both lead this process from day to day and to meet with you today to make sure that we have the most uh, detail. Okay, so just so I could, because I only have a, another minute, uh, you're saying that he's not at work right now and uh, he's entrusting you to, to take this on. Okay, uh, I wish him a speedy recovery. So we've heard from the organization and advocates that the administration has run a failed process and has allowed for the NYPD to run it all, which is why I want Commissioner Shea to be here. Um, but I've heard from advocates that the administration pulled together a lead committee that was supposed to have a role independent from the NYPD run process. Uh, but Mock J and the First Deputy Mayor's Office held one meeting and then completely dropped the communications with a dozen or so advocates that pulled together um, after the response, after the respond, they responded. Um, given the complete failures of how this process, and I think it's already come out already this uh, in this hearing, what specific organizations that have had long-standing expertise on police reform uh, and who have regularly criticized the NYPD given uh, power to help develop the city's plan uh, we're hoping that you can really engage those organizations. I, I really want to thank you for asking that question. We are certainly hoping um, that we hear from organizations who want to have really difficult discussions with us. You know, we are not looking um, to only talk. Let to me just pause you there. That's that. That's a aggressive move. Um, it's it's one thing to just wait for organizations to come. I'm asking for a proactive move that the administration is engaging in that is act. We know the organizations that are uh, that are wanting to be in the room. That's what I'm trying to find out. I'm expired. Sure, so as, as I mentioned in my testimony, the, the order requires um, the mayor to convene the police chief and community stakeholders um, and to allow all stakeholders um, to submit recommendations for our reform plan. We've gone far beyond that <laughs> and have been doing um, a great amount of outreach to, to many, many organizations in partnership with um, the three co-sponsors here. That certainly includes policy experts um, and we can speak to um, the more specific um, advocates, experts and community groups that we've spoken to. Um, but I also just wanna reiterate that this process is not over. If any members are hearing from constituents or groups that we haven't met with yet, that we haven't reached out to, we absolutely want to do so. Um, uh, I, will, I will ask um, Marcos to speak to um, some of the, the regular experts in this area that we've been working with. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to come back on a uh, second round. Next up, thank you, Council Member Menchaca. Um, next up will be Council Member Riley, followed by Council Member Lander. Time starts now. Thank you. thank you, Chair Adams and administration. I really do appreciate, uh, most importantly, the families uh, that came out today to give their testimony. Uh, 
the basis of today's conversation has been accountability and transparency. Um, and seeing what we just uh, realized, my first day actually started last Wednesday and what we've seen at the Capitol. Um, and seeing also what we've seen during this summer um, when we protested um, for George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, has there been any accountability that came from the leadership of NYPD uh, to condemn the actions of those who participated um, in the riot at the Capitol this past Wednesday? Um, my next question um, also is, I heard a lot about stakeholders having a say-so um, for the police reform process, um, but we do have families on this call who are also stakeholders who are immediately impacted by police shooting. Have they been given the opportunity to be a part of this process also? Um, and last but not least, um, there was a report that came out this weekend with the de-escalation program in Newark um, that seemed to, to work out for them that had, I believe, one shooting, um, which happened at the end of last year. Um, has NYPD looked into that de-escalation program and thought about um, incorporating it into theirs? Thank you. Thank you so much and congratulations, Councilman. Um, we're glad you could be here with us today. Thank you for your time. Um, to, to speak to your first question, um, we think it's essential for the department to have real accountability. That means um, discipline for individual officers, for individual complaints and accountability for the department as a whole when systemic issues are, are identified. Um, I'm happy to have the opportunity to speak to um, how horrible the events were last week at the Capitol. Um, but could the police department please speak to, um, I think that the question was changes that have been made that came from PD leadership since the protests this summer. Um, and so I would love for the police department to speak to that and we'll just reiterate that we're grateful for the reports of the Department of Investigation and the Law Department and um, the mayor is already committed to, to implementing all of the recommendations that came out of those, including one that we think is particularly meaningful um, and that's um, consolidating the independent external oversight agencies, which um, will lead us to, to take a really big step toward increasing um, both that individual and systemic accountability. Um, but PD, could you speak to um, any changes that have been made since the summer? Yes, hi, it's Chief Holmes and congratulations, Councilman. So I'll speak to changes that have been made since the demonstration, uh, since the demonstrations last summer. So there've been several changes uh, made as a result of that. One, I think key position that was replaced, we used to have an assistant chief, I'm sorry, a deputy chief, who, oh, was, who was the chief of operations. And operations oversees the deployment for our disorder control. They oversee the mock drills that are put in place. So people are very familiar with what it is that's the conduct that's supposed to be uh, conducted during demonstrations. As a result of that, what we identified was there was a lack of training as far as disorder control. Uh, back then, we, have, we still have certain task force that are identified to actually take on these responsibilities during demonstrations. Uh, but we were met with challenges last summer that were never seen. And I've been here a little over 30 years uh, within the department and especially the numbers of people that we were met with and not to mention some of the bad actors that attempted to blend in with that. But with that being said, um, there was training giving to 10, probably about 12,000 members were retrained in disorder control. Uh, I told you about the um, chief that's in place, the leadership, the executives were also uh, giving extent to essential training regarding disorder control. Um, and, and maybe that addresses, maybe, maybe not. It addresses, I know our uh, public safety chair addressed earlier today with some of the questioning that went on with executives and DOI. Uh, but I can, I can honestly say there were a lot of them that were out there that really, really weren't as well versed as they should have been when dealing with disorder control. Um, so there have been a lot of changes since then, as I, as I said, and this is before the DOI report, because what we always do in NYPD is take a look back, what could we have done differently, what could we have done better? And we identified a lot of those key areas that were identified in the DOI report. Um, and with that, that's uh, how the training was implemented. And also, I know we spoke about taking into consideration the recommendations uh, made by the uh, that were uh, forthcoming in the DOI report. I hope that answers your question. 
to speak to, sorry just just to speak to your question about um the de-escalation training in Newark we we have spoken members of the administration um and the police department have certainly um been in communication um, with Newark and improving de-escalation is certainly a part of, of this reform plan and and will be always an, an ongoing goal of improving policing and just to answer one more question from Councilman Riley, uh, congratulations again on those that a lot. We look forward to working with you in the future, but I think the members of the, of the NYPD, like most people, were horrified by it, what we saw in Washington, D.C. last week. It was outrageous and, uh, you know, to, to attack the most fundamental moment of democracy, the people said, oh, transfer of power, was shocking to all of us. Um, Okay, I believe we're ready. Um, Council member 11, you're gonna be up next. Time starts now. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I appreciate the time. Um, uh, I want to ask about um, discipline. Um, a recent New York Times report um, identified that, um, that the Commissioner takes the recommendations from CCRB approximately 29% of the time. So CCRB does its, uh, does its investigation. Sometimes it'll conduct its own um, uh, you know, administrative um, trial of sorts. Other times it's an NYPD um, trial, but 29% of the time uh, the commissioner takes that recommendation because and the reason he can only, he has the discretion to take the recommendation is that the commissioner um, has the full authority under uh, the ad code section 14115. Um, first off, I mean, first question is, can you explain why 29% of the time uh, the, the recommendations are taken from the CCRB? That includes, by the way, um, instances where the CCRB and the officer, the offending officer have actually uh, made a plea uh, deal um, and um, and there are instances where the commissioner does not take that take that recommendation. So first, can you explain why that percentage is so low? Secondly, um, uh, at a recent CCRB meeting, Chair Fred Davey uh, was um, said, and this was in a ProPublica article from a couple of weeks ago, um, that it is time to look at final authority, meaning um, time to uh, explore changing that final authority discretion to the commissioner under 14115. So my first question is why are, is it so low that that um, uh, concurrence rate, and um, and why uh, uh, and and do does the administration agree and is it going to be part of this plan to reform um, 14115, uh, taking full final discretionary authority away from the police commissioner on discipline. Thank you very much for this question. Um, we absolutely agree that CCRB is a fundamental component of police oversight. And I know working with council, we've seen them strengthened and enhanced significantly over the past several years. Um, we have met with CCRB a number of times um, for, for this initiative. Um, they have also led on public engagement with youth and with other civilian um, oversight uh, agencies, and we're very grateful to them for that. Um, they've made their recommendations to the administration um, as part of this plan extremely clear, um, and I think you'll be hearing from them later today. Um, they hosted a youth town hall with their youth advisory council. Um, if you haven't seen it, I believe it's on their website. I highly recommend watching it. Oh, check it out. <laughs> um, it's absolutely critical that CCRB be fully empowered to perform their oversight role, and that includes um, making sure they have access to the investigative materials. Um, we want to ensure that all of the oversight agencies are working seamlessly together and performing their roles as effectively as possible. Um, and that really speaks to the DOI recommendation um, to, to um, consolidate, consolidate oversight agencies. Um, and we are working to implement that this year, as the mayor said. Um, so I uh, will ask Marco Soler from the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice to speak to um, why that recommendation is so important and how it will improve oversight. And I'll okay. also ask the, the police department to speak to the disciplinary matrix that's going to be coming I out. know about the disciplinary matrix. I wanna know why it's so low, 29%, uh, 
um, uh, the the uh, the concurrence rate or the, the that when the commissioner ta um, actually implements the recommendations of CCRB and very specifically, does this administration agree with Chair Fred Davey that it is time to reform 14115 and remove full discretion, final discretion from the police commissioner um, so that uh, so that so that New Yorkers can have some confidence that there is a fair system in place for discipline. Because right now, as you heard from the first panel, and as I'm sure you have heard from if in these public uh, uh, listening sessions, it, it is New Yorkers do not have confidence when they see that it takes five or six years to fire file fire Daniel Pantaleo. Um, they don't see any other officers uh, held accountable that were involved in Eric Garner's death. And um, uh, there was even, and then, and then when the city court council says in court, well, we don't have to discipline those officers mm -hmm. because the police commissioner has full authority. That was in a, in a political article earlier this summer um, regarding the, the Garner case. So does the administration agree with Fred Davey, the chair of the CCRB, that it is time now to give New Yorkers some confidence that there's a fair and impartial adjudication of disciplinary um, complaints, mm -hmm. um, uh, especially when it comes to use of force. So I'm sorry, I just, it's, it's, this is something I feel very strongly about. Uh, I'm being told I have to move on though. <laughs> um, I'll start by saying that no idea is off the table for what will be in our reform plan at this point. I absolutely agree that with that um, low concurrence rate between CCRB recommendations and discipline, it's extremely difficult to build trust with the community. It's extremely difficult to, to show that there are real accountability mechanisms. Um, so we are looking um, at the matrix that I would like um, PD to yep. talk about, um, which one of the major goals is to um, make sure to increase that um, concurrence to make sure that everyone um, sticks to the matrix and that there is um, transparency, um, significantly more transparency um, around the discipline, discipline process and around um, the police department's decisions. Um, there is really no accountability without that consistency, without that transparency, and without the timeliness that you talked about as well. Um, that is a major goal of the matrix, um, but it's also yep. Um, a major goal of the other um, much larger policy decisions that we have to make. So I'll ask the police department. And I agree and applaud you all for, for the efforts that you've made in our former chair, now Queensborough President Donna Don Richards for, for implementing the matrix, because I do think that that's an important, um, it's an important tool. Absolutely. Council Member Levin, we will now turn to Council Member Miller followed by council member Lander and uh, council member Rosenthal. Those are the remaining council members that I have, that I see have used the Zoom hand raise function. If there are any other council members who would like to ask questions, please raise your hands. Council member Miller. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon now uh, to chair uh, and all those involved, particularly the families. I hope that you are still with us and, and, and so that you see that we are attempting to give this hearing and your uh, causes the gravity and the depth that they deserve. But I would like to raise a public objection to this hearing being held simultaneously at the same time that we are hearing the, uh, have a hearing on racial impact of rezonings uh, uh, in the land use and to read the report and I'm listening as much as I can here this morning and I see a lot about the proposed uh, what has been done in some some of the work some of the forums that have been held and talking about some of the upcoming objectives objections objectives based on uh, uh, the reforms and, 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 and oversight goals. Um, and, and, and I would submit that over the past uh, uh, year, two, three, that if you, uh, depending on your geography, uh, one might believe that this has been impactful. 
and then you step outside your zone and you kind of see that it is business as usual, uh, particularly in these uh, uh, marginalized uh, communities. And so um, what we see is that in these uh, historically disenfranchised communities that is business as usual and that we would like to see a difference in the impact uh, on the, uh, as Steve just mentioned, as others uh, uh, in terms of discipline, uh, number one, um, but in terms of policies and procedure actually making a difference. And so with that being said, uh, could you uh, once again elaborate on uh, discipline and then could you let me let us know if um, if bail reform, uh, uh, the executive budget, or legislative reform such as chokehold and and 50A has any impact has had any impact on the implementation of of such reforms? And uh, obviously, I'm a little discombobulated to jump in back and forth. But if if we can talk about discipline and then talk. Ms. Davis, did you get the question? Yes, I did. Um, sorry, it, it froze uh, for a bit. Okay. Uh, th thank you very much. Um, we we absolutely agree that discipline is core to this plan. Um, with the the lifting of 50A, um, we really look forward to being able to have a lot more transparency about the discipline process. Um, I'll reiterate how essential we think improving the discipline process is for this overall plan. Um, there is no true accountability without discipline for individual officers, um, as well as um, accountability for the department as a whole for systemic issues. Um, what officers are, are disciplined for should reflect the values of the department, should reflect the vision for public safety that communities have, um, should reflect what we think makes a good police officer. Um, and accomplishing this is a core goal of, of reform. Um, I would uh, ask the police department to, to talk through the discipline matrix that will be coming out at the end of the week and how it fits into our larger goals for improving discipline. Sure, so um, I think the, the most important thing about the matrix is that it is a living document. It's something that we are committed to continuously looking at with feedback from the public and um, input from our communities. So as you may know, we first introduced the matrix in August, late August for review. It was open for public comment for a little bit over 30 days. And in that uh, time frame, we got about 560 comments. Um, we also got uh, 10 letters that were uh, much more thorough and detailed from a number of partners, some of which are on this call today. They included CCRB, CCPC, the Federal Monitor, AG, Legal Aid, and, and, and others, again, that are on the call. Um, these letters and our other comments highlighted some, some very important feedback. We made uh, some significant revisions to the matrix uh, after reviewing that, and uh, it'll be posted by the end of this week. So I, I also want to add that this process, we, we realized was a, was a very good one in getting public feedback. Um, we want to try to implement this a little bit uh, more uh, formally going forward, bringing public feedback into the development of, of the policies around the department. And, and, and has these uh, events of, of legislative policies introduced have had an impact on implementation of these stated goals? Because what we've seen on the street and in our districts that police are performing differently because, and, and they are saying uh, literally because of bail reform, because of other policies that they can no longer do their job, call your council member literally businesses and constituents are being told. Um, what impact does this have on moving further with these uh, type of reforms? And how do we address this uh, in terms of oversight and reform within the department? 
is it within the responsibilities or purviews of, of NCO offices, executive offices, who has the authority to, on behalf of the uh, department, make such statements? So I, I can speak to bail reform. Um, bail reform has certainly helped the city it's, uh, uh, you know, work toward achieving our goals of creating a smaller, safer, and fairer justice system um, and reduce, safely reducing the jail population so that we can um, work toward closing the jails on Rikers Island. Um, Marcos from the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice can speak more to how um, bail reform has, um, we, we don't have any data to okay. suggest that bail wow. reform has contributed to- Good, good afternoon. I am actually, you know, I, 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 while I do this, I, I, I wanna thank you so much uh, to the chairs for having this important hearing along with the public advocate, but I do wanna wage a, 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 an objection to this hearing happening simultaneously at the same time we are addressing. Yeah, as we said earlier, we are in conflict right now with two hearings and land use dealing with two similar, believe it or not, uh, subject matter having to do with people of color right now. So Councilmember Miller, who was my co-chair of the BLAC and I want to make this known that uh, we have got to do better with our scheduling uh, for council. This is affecting how we are working today. So council member Miller is now also asking his questions as we both have <laughs> devices up together as a lot of my other colleagues right now. So we're gonna excuse him to ask his questions in the land use hearing and come back. So council, let's continue. Thank you, Chair. So we'll turn to Councilmember Lander next, uh, followed by Councilmember Rosenthal, and we'll see if Councilmember Bell is back. Time starts now. Thank you very much uh, to the Chair and to the staff, actually, for moving me on the list. I also, in that racial equity and land use hearing. So, um, Chair Adams, I really want to thank you for setting the tone you did by having the families first um, and making clear how far we have to go and how, unfortunately, little this process um, seems to be moving us in that in that direction. Um, we we heard from those families this morning, and I want to build on the questions that Councilmember Levin and Councilmember Miller asked. Um, we heard from families whose loved ones were killed by NYPD officers, and many of the relevant officers still have not been disciplined or fired. In particular, Wayne Isaacs, who killed Delron Small almost five years ago, is still on the force. And we heard Delron siblings say this morning that the NYPD still hasn't served CCRB charges on Wayne Isaacs, even though the CCRB sent them months ago. So I guess my first question is, what's the holdup on serving the CCRB charges on Wayne Isaacs? I'll ask the police department to respond to your specific question, but I wanna thank you for the question and reiterate um, how important um, we think for this process, the goals are of improving consistency, timeliness, transparency um, of discipline and, and um, we do believe that that's absolutely necessary for accountability and building trust. We all, we all, and Ms. Davis, you know, I really appreciate uh, and respect you. We, we all believe that's necessary, but we're not doing it. Anyway, let me ask the question. What, what's the holdup on serving the CCRB charges on Officer Isaacs? Uh, Council member, I apologize. We, sitting here, I, we don't have the information on that particular case. We can look into it and get back to you, um, but I can't. I'm stop. sorry, can you say that again, please? Like sitting here, Actually, could you address it to 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 Delron Small's family, who I believe are still on, rather than to me? Yes, Mr. Dempsey, I, I apologize. I, I I don't currently have the information. Um, and Ms. Davis, I believe I, I don't have the information with me right now. I, I can look into it. Um, but as of sitting here right now, I don't know the what's going on with that particular case. I apologize. So, so I mean, if if it were otherwise, Madam Chair, and this had happened earlier. I all say like let's adjourn this here back um, Ms. Davis said right there's a way to build confidence or trust in systemic reinvention or reimagining or reform when the most basic forms of accountability are not being attended to it's five years ago and we've got a CCRB process and they sent charges over and not only haven't they been processed we don't even get information at a hearing that's supposed to be on accountability and we hear sort of about a matrix, but not one concrete proposal for strengthening CCRB authority, for making their decisions binding. So I, I don't have any more questions, but unfortunately, um, 
this hearing is not helping move us forward. This process is not helping us move us forward. Let's start with accountability and then we can move forward past that. Thank you. And I, I, I really do appreciate those comments. I don't think that anyone um, being with you today will argue with you about um, that being an absolutely essential place to start in recognizing harm that's been done by lack of accountability but, in the past and, and building- But not in the past, in the present, right at this yeah. moment, it's no good to say we recognize that's a past history and we're going to do better when you've got families on the call asking for information that of course mm -hmm. you have, the NYPD has those charges. They've had them for months. So this is not about a past problem. This is about a exact right in this moment problem. And you, as much as you you want to, you can't move us forward in this process while you're sitting at a moment of inability to provide basic accountability to the folks who started the hearing. So I mean, I appreciate you're saying it's important, and I I know you personally believe it. But this hearing can't move us forward when when as it is. And, and Councilmember Lander, uh, just to thank you very much uh, for your remarks. And um, I would be remiss if I didn't say that I agreed with you to an extent, but this hearing is to do exactly what you just did. Okay, so- Thank you. And, and, and Madam Chair, I, I, I agree with you. Know, I, I, you're, you've done a great job setting this up this way so that we heard that family at the top and, and I appreciate your leadership here in time. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Council? Next up will be Council Member Rosenthal, followed by Council Member Menchaca and Council Member Levin. Time starts now. Thank you so much. And Chair, thank you for this amazing hearing and giving all of us the opportunity to hold the NYPD's feet to the fire. Uh, most importantly, having them hear directly from the families at the start of the hearing, uh, in addition to your really terrific opening statement. I appreciate that. Um, my question has to do with the uh, how exact it has to do with changing the culture of the NYPD. Everyone knows that culture change, fundamental culture change, uh, is it must be required in order to achieve our goals. Um, in addition to accountability, which I thought Councilmember Levin's line of questioning was spot on. Um, how do you change culture? And I am looking for specifics. I'm not looking for your plan to talk to people, retrain, or hear more stakeholders. What I mean is, um, you know, in Finland, for example, uh, the Department of Correction officers need to get a social work degree before they're allowed to become a correction officer. That's a fundamental change in culture, right? Because they are trained as social workers and then brought in to Department of Corrections. So what I'm asking you is what is the meaningful change that you plan for or that you're doing now? Because as long as I've been on the council, We've passed retraining bill after retraining bill after retraining bill. And you've always said, oh, yes, we're retraining, which sort of gets to Chair Adams point about changing the entire patrol guide. But how are you going to change the culture, underlying culture of the NYPD? Thank you. Thank you for this question. Um, culture change in the police department is certainly one of the most essential things to be able to accomplish in order to have the successful implementation of any other kind of reform. Um, specifically, we have heard a lot about the need to create a culture of accountability, to create um, a culture no, of- No, I know what we need. Uh, I'm asking you what you're gonna do. Sure, so I, I think you're right that trainings, though an important part of creating things like a culture of active bystandership or duty to intervene um, are important. Um, it's absolutely not the entirety of what has to be done to change culture. Um, there is certainly a need to augment um, implicit bias trainings to-, to We already passed legislation, you've already done that. Hypothetically, you already did that before the peaceful demonstrations this summer. Lori Combo 
passed that bill a couple of years ago. So that's been done. What I'm asking you is what fundamental change are you going to make to change culture in the NYPD? You haven't answered it yet. And my guess is your report won't answer it either. Well, I'll start by saying we're certainly looking for as many recommendations as ideas from experts and from yourself and all council members. Um, have you considered requiring NYPD officers becoming social workers before going to the police academy? Does PD want to respond? I think that, you know, we are thinking- I mean, you're from the first deputy mayor's office. It's your response that I'm looking for, not PD's. What kind of leadership is the first deputy mayor taking in this process? So I'm certainly telling you that we agree that culture change is one of the most essential things for having any reform be successful. That does involve enhancing training and improving training, but it's a lot more than that as well. Um, we are looking for ways to kind of infuse um, community members into trainings in a way that I think will be a really, really important part. I mean, let's just be sure be clear. that there's kind of our immersed in the communities that they're serving before they start serving there. Um, sorry. I mean, I just want you to know that your responses in this hearing are not good enough. So expect that as a response from this committee is my guess um, upon release of your report, number one. And number two, it shows me ongoing lack of commitment from the mayor's office to make serious change in the NYPD. We saw the exact same thing with the Special Victims Division and the DOI report on the Special Victims Division. The fact that the mayor did not insist those changes be made. The fact that the mayor did not insist they go ahead and redo that investigation after the supposed changes. And the fact that the mayor allowed DOI to drop its investigation of the child victim division. So I'm, I think part of this hearing, of course, is you know what's the PD doing, but we're looking for leadership here. And that comes from what you're saying is the first deputy mayor's office. So uh, I, I yield back to the chair. Thank yeah, you. I appreciate that. I, I wanna reiterate that we are dedicated to what you're talking about, especially through culture change, which is something that absolutely does not happen overnight. I also think it is important to hear from my colleagues, from Thomas Giovanni and from Marcos, the chief of staff of the mayor's office of criminal justice, who have very regular contact with many experts around the country about culture change. All right. So uh, if I, so I will address your question directly, council uh, member. A, there are many changes that we are thinking about in terms of requirements for the police officers that we are considering. But it starts with what we understand to be the role of the police officer. I am not completely sure that when you say, for instance, let's follow the example of Finland, where we all of police officers, sorry, all correctional officers are trained as social workers, which is actually what we want to the force. I think we are approaching this differently, which is, what is the role of them we want for the police department? We want a role for the police department, which is much more limited, which it has a much more reduced footprint in the city of New York. And the primary role of the police officer, ultimately well-defined should be to protect both our, uh, protect the citizens from crimes, and obviously to protect our rights and liberties, and also do that in a manner in which instills a, a trust. It is hard, I am not disputing that that is one option. A lot of people talk, for instance, about changes directly to educational requirements. I think in order to address that question, first, you, we have to address the question of what is the role that we want to see in the police department. So what Chelsea wants to try to suggest here is we would appreciate your input and the input of the council on what is ultimately the role that they see the police department to have in New York City, not just in this right now, but in the years to come. What we have seen is for years, the mayor has said, we are trying to reduce the footprint. We are trying to change the role of the police department in the ways they have interactions. We have to address dynamics of enforcement and under enforcement, et cetera. And I think then certainly 
we I can assure you that we are addressing issues of cultural change, but cultural change within the department is not just a matter of one specific action, whether it is changing the requirement of the officer, whether it is a implemented a residency requirements, whether it's a, a multitude of things. What I can assure you is that we are looking into all of those things, but can we are not approaching me, these. With all due respect, yeah. can you give me one example of something you're looking into that would result in serious culture change? One example. When a, without prejudicing the process in which we are elaborating internally, you want me to give you an example then we'll say, this is something that I think might change the police department. Well, I can tell you one example in my mind, certainly very important. The police department has said that officers are both a fight, crime fighters and problem solvers. Within their whole set of skills and the police department doesn't have about how to solve problems. In order to solve problems, you have to truly address issues of what does it mean in the community. Within them, there are major problems about the fact that there is not a strategic vision that allows the department to be problem solvers. There are models right now nationally in many other jurisdictions that said this is a place in which police officers become problem solvers, right? So, for instance, Where? there are very, a, in many jurisdictions in the United States, can have adopted a much more. Pardon me? Name one. One jurisdiction, for instance, the jurisdiction of Puerto Rico, then is going on their consent decree, the New Orleans and Seattle, et cetera. A, they have implemented model called SAR, for instance. A, a SAR is a, is a form of response to problems that allows the police department, what I am trying to say is in order for, to incorporate a SARA model, for instance, which is in many consent right. decrees in the United respect, States. SARA is not new. Uh, I know I it's not new. I'm just, do you ask me for an example. The division has yeah. implemented SARA to no effect. So again, I'm mm -hmm. asking for one change that you think will fundamentally change the culture in the NYPD. And, you know, I, I'm not looking for gobbledygook and I'm not, I, I don't think the public is either. And, and your one example you gave right now is something that supposedly the NYPD already does and has been doing for a bunch of years. I, so really, I, I'm looking forward to your report and seeing something that is meaningful. And I see that uh, someone else from the, is it the PD who, who wants to respond? No, okay. I think we've, we've spoken to, to many things that will change culture. I think it's important to recognize that, you know, one thing alone can't do that and that this is an iterative process and we want to make a comprehensive plan. I think a lot of, um, <coughs> The Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice and the police department's efforts to expand these community-based relationships with cure violence providers can go a very long way toward changing culture. Um, the police department is also soon going to be um, implementing a training called ABLE to increase kind of the culture of active bystandership and duty to intervene. Um, which right, and just so you know, Hollaback has been training every police uh, uh, um, precinct office in bystander training for the last five years, by the way, unpaid. So been there, done that. I'm looking for real change. The police I wanted to go back, the, wait, wait, well, just give me one second. I just wanted to go back to directly address one of the, the first point you made, you made up about the social worker aspect. Um, there is genuine community push for what you expressed in having that kind of a training. There is also impacted community push against the idea of having police officers think they're social workers. That's what Mr. Solar was getting at when we talk about what we really think the role is. There are a lot of people who think, I don't want my police, and have expressed to us, I don't want them thinking they're social workers. I don't want them performing those roles in our community. So but one of the things that we're doing, workers, they'll get what a one of the things I'm saying to you, and then go to the academy. The, and the only thing I'm saying training. is, you're revising and the only thing I'm, training. What I'm trying to say about that is, when we listen to both sides of these arguments, that's what we're trying to get together and figure out the balance that we have to strike. It, okay. If I made one more thing, what, one Thank of the you. things- I appreciate that, Mr. Giovanni. Sorry, I didn't mean to- No, 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 no problem. What, one of the things that I was trying to highlight is that one of the many reforms have been done in an individual basis. What we have not done, for instance, is to think about an entire packet of attitude. So it's true that in certain jurisdictions have implemented certain programs, whether Sarah and others, 
What has changed is, and what we don't have in New York City, for instance, is an staffing plan that tells you exactly what are the needs of the police department and how that, and what is the model that is going to drive that staffing plan. That was the difference. The difference is right now, what you have is some people within the department doing certain things, but not necessarily a comprehensive plan. That is what we are trying to develop here. And I understand your need to know. And certainly I think what we have been doing is trying to talk to many council members to understand and members of the community to understand the priorities. What I am saying is you have to give us the opportunities to produce the plan, to have a conversation with your office and to all the folks around the city in order to put forward the plan, but not to say you have not done anything. This is, in, I don't think this is a productive way to go about this. In so far as, as I said, we aren't sure you then we are working on that. We just want to do it in a framework which has not been just one specific policy here, disconnected from all the other elements of then the police department needs to change. There are a lot of reforms that the department needs, not just one. And until now, the difference is we were addressing one issue, CCRB, we were addressing one issue, a issues of diversity. Now we have an opportunity to finally have a comprehensive plan of reform. And you have to think how reform in one area affects mm -hmm. the reform in another area. You That's know, what I was I'm, I'm not asking for any more time. Uh, Chair Adams, thank you for, yep. for giving the extra time for this. I won't do a second round. But I just have to say, you can't give that kind of, uh, Mr. Solar, that kind of answer and not be able to answer uh, um, Council Member Levin's questions about simply uh, changing the and the police commissioner having the final say and turning that over to an independent group. And yeah, I, you can't I was cut off. I couldn't provide Council the answer. Levin's I'm happy question. to address that answer. I, I was cut off. They didn't, they didn't let me address that answer. I was ready. Chelsea have asked me to address that answer, but I didn't have a chance to provide an answer. I, got I defer to the chair about whether or not to give time on that. I mean, if it can't be articulated at this juncture, I don't know. Uh, anyway, thank you, chair. I appreciate you. I, I'm just gonna uh, jump in and thank you very much, Councilmember Rosenthal for your questions. Thank you very much. Mr. Solar, just, just to, to, to uh, kind of uh, piggyback on what my colleague was just asking about specific roles of the NYPD, uh, what they should be handling and what they should not potentially be ha handling, particularly with regard to reform, does the NYPD um, or you, do you believe that any function should be transferred away from the NYPD? Has that topic come up in your discussions? And I will let you elaborate on that answer. Yes, that topic has come in our discussions. And it's my view, uh, at least the view of the mayor's office of criminal justice has been the view for a long time. Then part of addressing the dynamics of enforcement and enforcement in the city for many years requires to certainly a transfer or to think about an effective way to transfer certain functions away from the police department and certainly try to figure out how the role of the police department can be refocused primarily to the task of reducing uh, the main drivers of gun violence in the city and a lot of other major problems that we have around the area of crime prevention. Yes, it's, it's my view then that is necessary. Can you elaborate think? a, a little bit more on what those resp what responsibilities you feel should be moved out of NYPD? I don't want to prejudge again uh, the, the internal deliberations that we are having a, in my office, the first deputy mayors, ultimately because my office is. Is providing advice, but it's not ultimate, the ultimate decision maker as the mayor and the first deputy mayor are. Uh, but are you, certainly, sure, I, I'm happy yeah. to provide um, a yeah. little bit of information um, specifically on um, what we have heard over and over again from the community during this process, yeah. um, during the the task, the crisis response task force, um, as well as you know for for many years about making sure um, that we have the correct citywide health to mental health crises. Um, so we are. Um, working closely with Thrive on the implementation of the, the pilot to have um, a health only EMT um, and social worker response to um, cr uh, mental health crisis calls that come into 911 and certainly want to talk about um, implementation of that kind of a model on a much larger scale through this process. Um, we've also been talking to the office to end domestic and gender based violence about um, some uh, 
working more closely with community-based organizations to respond to family violence. Um, we're also completely committed to um, implementing all of the transfers that were announced over the summer, um, and that includes homeless outreach um, vending. I'm happy to answer or have um, and work with the, the police department to, to answer any questions that you have about the status of those transfers. Um, apologies, Thomas, I think um, you That's wanted... okay. Well, actually, it, it gives me a good opportunity to piggyback on what, what Chelsea just said. All of those activities are on, uh, ongoing under consideration, certainly the mental health uh, status of police engagement is on the table, actively engaged uh, previous to this, uh, uh, this process and will continue to go on through this process. We've seen school safety uh, have its changes that are going to continue. One of the new things that you ask about uh, in this process that we hope to come out of this plan will be the vigorous and robust and regular community and collaborative oversight and auditing and public reporting about these things. One of the issues that keeps bringing us back to these tables in some of these same ways is we don't know what happens while it's happening until it happens to break. As I, I work in the law department and I've settled a lot of, have settled a lot of cases with us, uh, that's not the place to learn if you don't have to. So one of the things that we would like to see throughout the plan that we will put forward uh, to the greatest extent possible is inter interjecting those moments of community feedback, public reporting, and actual auditing that comes out and is available to the public so before we implement or as we implement procedures and as we review them, either renew them, augment them or change them. What we haven't had traditionally, historically here is a great deal of community input as we build, right? We've taken things, we come back down from the mountain, we give things, we go back up to the mountain, we do things, right? Well, people need to be on the ground, but that's, a, you wanna talk about community change, that's not a policy, that's a perspective, right? And we can't prove that to you here. We can only say we're going to do it. And like everybody else who sat here, either do it or not. That's all we have here. We know where community trust is on many of these, these issues. And we know how it got here. Anybody who can look out a window knows what happened. But we have to go ahead now. And we just have to work on it in the ways that we're trying to talk about. Uh, I, wanna, I, I do also want to go back to the other. Uh, never mind. Never, I'm good. You're good? Yes. Okay, I'm going to thank you again. Thank you. I'm going to go back to uh, the, the, the subject again of moving some of those responsibilities away from M NYPD. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I am so sorry. That is exactly the point I wanted to make. The, the lawyer yeah. in me, the human in me wanted to shut up. The lawyer in me needs to talk. Um, no. When you talk about removing the, uh, 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 the police commissioner from the ultimate decision making policy, there, it's a legal question that is not going to be easy to untangle or short. He, that, that power, as I understand it, was placed into the charter, not by us, but by the state. So in order to move that, it would, it would require state action as well as local action. And on top of that, one of the implications there is the discipline system itself. Because if we remove him, then we have to go to what the bargaining system would actually do for that relationship. So I just gave you three Gordian knots that have to be dealt with before we can do that. So it's not a quick thing. Understood. And it may not be, and by the way, be careful what we ask for if we're not thinking about what's new. Because all that we've been talking about so far is taking the NYPD's discipline system and making it look like the rest of the country. I don't know a model that we say we like in anybody else's discipline system that we want to import. So just getting back to that might be an improvement. It might be a thing that we need to do that we want to do. but somebody got to show me the, the positive comparison to say, well, why can't we be like that? I understand we need to be traveling. We absolutely need to be seeing what people are doing. But when we talk about the historical relationships here and what we want to project in the future, I do challenge anybody. I think I know a decent amount about this. I challenge anybody to show me a department who's done it right, soup to nuts, right? So we've got a lot of work to do and we're doing it. Some of this is new. Some of this is old. A lot of it is old. But I do think we have to think about these relationships differently. And I understand the hits we're supposed to be taking today and we're going to take them because we earned a lot of it. But we are gonna move forward. People do have to come through this door. We are open, we have asked everybody, we continue to ask people to come to participate. There have been missteps, there will be missteps, but we're still here and we're not going anywhere. Thank you, thank you again for that. And I agree, I agree with you 100%. Um, and again, that's what this hearing is all about, to get all of this out and open and on the table for all of us to hear and understand. And, and, and again, you know, you, you express how critical this is. It really, really is. It's very critical. And there is no magic potion. 
for reform. We haven't seen it anywhere, uh, least of all at the national level where we need to see it the most right now. So uh, we definitely need to hear it, hear it, get it out, um, listen to each other. Again, I think a lot of the frustration, at least on my end, comes from the fact that this should have started months before it started. This, this, I mean, the order was out there. We are up against a timeline and we stand to lose money. The very, very agency that right now we're speaking stands to lose funding because a timeline is not, you know, is, is in play here. So, so again, um, this is all really great information. It's great feedback. I'm going to ask uh, one more quick question. I'm going to hand it back for the second round to my colleagues. Um, for Ms. Davis, last week, the mayor said that he was forming a charter revision commission and it might consider DOI's proposal of consolidating the PD, IG, CCRB, and the commission to combat police corruption into one single agency. Will that be a part of the plan? Uh, and when will you formally announce this commission? Thank you for that question. I, I, I don't have answers specifically about the Charter Revision Commission. However, I can absolutely speak to that recommendation. Um, as well as all the other recommendations in the DOI report, we will be recommending, we will be implementing them um, and putting forward those implementation plans as part of this, as part of this report. And that absolutely, um, as the mayor has said, will include um, the consolidation of the Civilian Complaint Review Board, um, the DOI uh, PDIG, um, as well as the CCPC. Um, we are gonna work with all of those stakeholders to make sure that we do this in the best way possible over the next year. Um, I'm not sure if it will be its own process or part of um, a Charter Revision Commission. We can absolutely let you know when we have more information about that. Um, but we do think that that's a really important recommendation for improving oversight, which I think is, is obvious to everyone is essential for um, increasing accountability, both at the individual officer level and at the systemic and the department level. Um, and both of those kinds of accountability are essential for culture change. And, and we do think that recommendation is important. As the mayor said, we'll be working to, to implement it this year and those plans will be part of this report of this reform plan. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna uh, hand it back over to council for round two for my colleagues, thank you. Thank you, Chair. I believe uh, Council Member Menchaca, you'd requested another round and followed by Council Member Levin, if you're still here. Council Member Menchaca. So for the city- Chair, I'm in the middle of asking the question in land use. Can I come in next after? Many people thank you. This call. That's how bad yeah, this is. There. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, Mr. Solo, you said, uh, I'm sorry, in responding to Council Member Rosenthal, you said that you wanted to respond to my question about um, whether, first off, why is the um, diversion rate so high between CCRB recommendations and the, and the discipline implemented by the police commissioner? And second, does, does the administration support um, what Chair Davey said um, in a public hearing recently that it's really time to examine taking, um, amending 14, 115 and, take, and taking um, full discretion uh, for final disciplinary authority away from the police commissioner. So that's the first yes. question. So we'll address your both questions. So what I said was, and I had a, we wanted to address the opportunity. What we know is that historically people have said that a CCIB was overcharging and people were, the CCIB was not providing sufficient evidence and then the CCIB was not taking enough uh, circumstances as a reason why to explain it the discrepancy between the a, a, a basically 100% rate or what would be a much, which is a much lower rate as you have said of 29%. What I can tell you is that obviously we do not believe those are main of the, some of the factors that explain, explain the reasons. I think that there are some structural factors that have to be taken into account that a, we need to address moving forward. One is, for instance, is whether or not the CCRB investigations have a are only focused on specific individuals as they should be, 
or have to be able to understand broader what is going to be the trajectory of that officer. A lot of the times the CCRB officer, the CCRB investigations do not have enough information because the police department has not shared that information about where is, what else do we need to know about that officer? What is that officer in his trajectory, et cetera? I think that there are some individual factors that explain the discrepancy. In other instances was under the previous administration, certainly, and in some instances under this administration, certainly the CCIB did not have enough resources. And as you know, the prosecution unit was not established until 2013 in order to move forward some of these cases. It has to do a lot with those processes. I'm simply explaining that it's not- That shouldn't have anything to do with whether or not the recommendations are taken are taken up well, by the by the police commissioner just because they don't have the resources for one thing this administration's been in office for seven years yeah. so that's really hard to blame the bloomberg administration no, I'm not, i was not trying point. to so, so okay. I'll, I'll... No, i was not trying to give me just one second please what i was trying to highlight is in the investigations if a specific police misconduct is far more complicated than that has to result in just one simple uh, raid the second is nationally the CCRB rate is not drastically different than it has been in other jurisdictions, which speaks to one of the problems over time, which I think is what we're trying to address. There is a certain weakness and have been a certain weaknesses in the oversight institutions for many years across the country, certainly in New York City. I'm one of the sorry. examples is the fact that we have a patchwork of agencies working in many different <laughs> ways and with very different jurisdictions. That has not helped to address this issue. This is why what we are trying to do, and to address your question, is to think about reform the disciplinary system as a whole and trying to oh, be reformed. This is maybe it was my fault for asking a why question first. Right. Let me get to the yes or no question. Do you agree with Chair Davey on his on his uh, assertion to, to look at uh, 14115 final disciplinary? That's a yes I think, or no I think it's always a, appropriate to think as to whether or not the police commissioner should have or should not have. I think in many instances, there are a lot of, as we indicated before, there are a lot, a lot of reasons to argue that a, the authority of the police commissioner should be, a, should be limited. And there are some instances to argue that the police actually, the commission policeman should not be limited because what okay. you don't want to do, if, what you don't want to do is to have an agency head who does not have authority over the department. And that right. is also except, something uh, that you Right, I said that, okay. But we could talk about it more. I just have two more quick why questions here. First why question is, um, why, does, uh, why does it take so long for the NYPD to provide body-worn camera footage to the CCRB? I've heard this from CCRB investigators that they do not get body-worn camera footage. They get stonewalled by the, M by the NYPD. Um, and the second question is, um, has this actually isn't a why question, this, has, has the, um, the New York City Police Department um, issued divergence letters for public consumption, for, for you know, facing the public, divergence letters every, as they have agreed to every time they diverge from a CCRB recommendation, which is what they're supposed to be doing. So, Councilman, so, I'll, I'll, I'd like to answer all of uh, your questions. Um, Okay. Just to, to get back to your previous question, um, and Marcos, you have very, very deep expertise on this, so thank you very much. I just want to reiterate that we have to think about both the long-term and the short-term ways to achieve our goals of increasing consistency, transparency, timeliness, and fairness of discipline. So that certainly includes answering long-term questions about state law changes that we may need, um, but also includes short-term strategies like mm -hmm which is also intended to improve concurrence um, as well as kind of the short medium term strategies that will have a big impact like um, the consolidation of the oversight agencies. Um, so I just want you to, to know that no ideas are off the table, but that we're absolutely looking at this from a perspective of what we need to do now, what we know we can commit to, and then what longer term reforms might be necessary and important. Um, to speak to the body-worn camera um, footage issue, um, I believe that a lot of um, uh, improvements have been made, um, uh, and I will let a PD speak to the specific work they have done 
um, recently to improve access to that footage for CCRB. Um, and I know you'll be hearing from CCRB later today, they've made it clear that improved access to such footage and, and to um, disciplinary records of officers is essential for them to do their jobs. And I just wanna make sure you know how seriously we're taking all of CCRB's recommendations. But I'll ask um, PD to speak to what's been done recently to improve that access to, to right. body on the footage. Okay, and, and I would like PD to also answer um, how are they keeping track of their of their timeliness of providing uh, that evidence to CCRB? Oh yes, and uh, PD can also speak to the question about divergence letters um, yeah. and um, the the importance of of lifting 50A on our ability to improve transparency here. Okay, and how do I find the divergence letters? I'd like to see them. That's it. Okay, so even I if I was a member of the public, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> some of that starting with uh, the body on camera video from CCRB. So we're absolutely committed to providing CCRB with whatever they need. Uh, there was Can everybody here? Uh, uh, kind of. We're absolutely committed to providing CCRB everything they need as far as body on camera footage. There were some delays that we encountered due to COVID this spring, but we are uh, back on track working to, to get them all the footage that they've requested. Uh, as of January 1st, we have about 500 open requests. 60% of them are uh, less than 30 days old. So we'll continue to, to work with them um, to get them everything that they're looking for to complete those investigations. Um, as far as the divergence letters, uh, it's something that, um, we, we are committed to looking through in this process to see if we can uh, really increase the transparency around those letters. And, and there's some other jurisdictions um, that have some strategies here that we are looking to uh, in, uh, in this plan to, to mimic and um, improve the transparency around those diversions. And, and I will add, while 50, the Civil Rights Law 50 a has been repealed, there is an outstanding uh, temporary restraining order on uh, releasing information related to discipline that's currently at ongoing FDA litigation. So as of today, we are restricted by court order, not by the Civil Rights Law 50A. Okay, so you're, you are currently not releasing all NYPD discipline records um, because of a TRO on the, on an, is that an appeal on the 50A or what's the, what's the TRO on? It was litigation instituted around the release, not appealing 50A, but the release of disciplinary records in the wake of 50A repeal. Okay, so there's a TRO and that's why you're not releasing the records, but that doesn't have anything to do with divergence letters. Divergence it's letters shouldn't, shouldn't be subject, right? Why would divergence letters be subject to, a, to that TRO? Divergence letters would be part of the disciplinary record. Um, so that's part of the TRO that we're currently under, the temporary restraining order. So that's, so that's the reason. So, so once the TRO is, is, uh, is lifted, uh, presumably, uh, uh, in accordance with the statute, uh, that the, that the state enacted last year, um, then we should be expecting to have all police disciplinary records, including divergence letters, um, made public. Is that correct? So right now we are working on uh, make a database that will make those records public when uh, the TRO is lifted. Um, okay. That, coupled with the matrix, will allow the public to really see how we're implementing and see where the data is. Okay. All right. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Levin. We'll turn to Councilmember Chaka. Uh, thank you, Chair, for the second round and for your leadership uh, here today. Uh, and as a, a member of this public safety committee, um, I want to ask the administration or NYPD, but one of you uh, to give us the status of, and this is following up on um, Brad Lander's conversation and questions with you all, the status of firing other officers named today in this hearing, specifically that of um, the officers who killed Mohammed Ba, Alan Felice, Kawasaki Trowick, 
Antonio Williams, and other officers that were involved in Eric Garner's death, like Justin D'Amico and Lieutenant Christopher Bannon. Uh, and I'm hoping that you can get back to the families and this committee. What is the status? Yeah, um, as I mentioned to Councilman Rolando before, I'm sitting here right now, I don't know the status of any individual uh, disciplinary matter, but we can look into it. So when can you get that to us? Um, right, so we, uh, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm gonna talk to our people, they said it's far, not far by the TRO. Give us a time, please. Um, yeah, we'll get back to the status by next month. Where we next month? Yeah. Can you give us a date just so that we can stay accountable to each other? Um, I will reach out to the committee next week to discuss where we are. The TRO, TRO like I said, may prevent us Losing some of the information for that existed, um, but I will reach out to the committee uh, on Monday to discuss further. Okay, um, I, I just want to leave everybody here who has been uh, engaging with us that the the longer conversation here that has been a more public conversation that has erupted in marches across the city this summer that we're asking the city council to uh, to do things like defund the NYPD and reallocate to our communities that were impacted by COVID. Um, all of that is, is not moving constructively. And what I, I think is really important in this conversation is that it is the NYPD and this administration that is, gonna, that is leading us to this breaking point. And it is yourselves that are actually gonna construct something that's gonna be um, a lot more transformative than you are willing to engage in uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to be held accountable. Our, this committee is going to be held accountable. The city council is going to be held accountable on how we approach this. Uh, and so uh, in some ways you have a big role to play in that. And today has been too little too late. Uh, and we have some work to do. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Chaka. Uh, do we have any more council member questions? If so, please use the Zoom hand raise function. Oh, I'm sorry, Council Member Rosenthal, you had one other question. I council do. Member. Now, I'll keep, I'll keep it short. Um, I want to go back, um, Mr. Giovanni. I really appreciated your statement. Very, very helpful. And I was wondering if you could give. Um, sum up what you, I don't know how to ask the question. It's great that you're doing the work of settling the cases, right? And you're thinking about when you settle, what types of cases are those and how do we preempt those types of cases from ever coming into being? That, That's a part I, of it. Yeah, can you talk, can you give some examples of, one or two examples of, what you've seen in settling cases and, and what kind of change you would be bringing to the table. Um, you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, I, it's the easiest example that comes to mind right now. We're in the middle of the monitorship. Uh, I was the lead uh, lawyer for us with working with the monitor for about five years. Um, the reduction in stop and frisk, which preceded the monitorship, but which has been uh, overseen and still remains a, a hot topic of how we're dealing with racial bias and racial uh, relationships in policing. Uh, that monitorship, as you as you may or may not know, touches also on some of the issues we talked about about uh, recruitment and 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 the actual uh, nature of the officers we get. So that's one. And and to put it in the context of cases and risk management, uh, you may you I think you probably do know that the entire structure that Floyd was built on came out of Daniels, another case. Right, that was the the issue. And so, what happens is we are learning through these cases sometimes things that we could learn between that. There was a lot of activity, for instance, before the Floyd case about stop and frisk from community members, from other researchers, from outside groups, from people. 
as a risk manager, from a risk management function, when I look at the case that is now, the monitorship, one, which is actually, in my opinion, the most widespread, large-scale, long-term monitorship in the history of law enforcement in this country, because we are the New York City Police Department. We have more police than anybody else. And this is about how we deal with black and brown people on the street, which is one of the biggest engagements in a city where people don't drive as much as they do every place else. So this is huge. Uh, and that came through a, a particular type of failure in a certain sense of risk management, because we shouldn't have to necessarily have a federal judge tell us to do something that other smart people can tell us we can adjust. So when I look at that case, what I say is how do we reverse engineer the moment before that and the moment before that? How do we get to that? And there are, and this is what I say when I talk about these working groups or these task forces, like whatever phrasing we put on the fact that we get other eyes on situations, on policies before they're rolled out and as they're being rolled out with good information. Another thing that we've talked about, again, I think I think about these things much more perspective wise and structurally than I do about a particular policy. One of the things that everybody has touched on, I think almost here, is the difficulty of information flow into and out of the New York City Police Department. I'm inspired. That's not an actual policy. Again, that's a perspective. We need to put timelines on some of these processes. We need to put a, a moment, a, an actual legislated or policy rule or agreed upon rule. A lot of the agencies function very well with just agreements between each other that they honor, right? We can do that. There are, the mechanism depends on the particular circumstance. And one of the reasons I think you're being disappointed is because we have the largest police department in the most many uh, uh, jurisdictions with the most people to support and the most subsets of people to support. When, when I look at the Albany website doing this work, for instance, they can have five meetings and touch a large number of, of different subgroups. I was just looking at this the other day. Queens, if we separated Queens itself from New York City, New York City would still be the first largest city and Queens would be the fifth in the country. We're talking about reimagining police for that group. That's not the same endeavor for everybody else. We do different things, different ways, and different solutions are necessary at different particular points. The orientation to get better information flow is absolutely present in everything you've heard us respond to when that subject has come up. We expect to put those mechanisms in these plans as is appropriate. And this is one of the reasons that PD has to lead in this area. Their procedures are the things that have to be changed, and they're the only ones who actually implement their procedures, just like any other agency. You know, if we were reforming sanitation, we'd have to have them at the table telling us how they do what they do and then making decisions with them. So I think there's a, a, a difficulty here because there are a lot of details that we're going to have to talk about as we also talk about this reimagining plan that was placed in, in a timetable. Let's understand, even if we had started working our best on day one, we're not reforming a 175-year-old problem in this year framework. What we can do is get an orientation to approach the problems hopefully differently than we've done and create structures that don't look like the old way. But nobody should have thought that we were going to come up with a plan that would have us have a new police department by April or shortly after April. That, that doesn't make, look at the problems. Everybody who started speaking has talked about 30-year, 40-year, 50-year problems. Yeah. It's not a possibility to do everything in that time period. We are trying to do our best, and I, and I absolutely do not want to make it sound as if I'm running away from the criticisms of the deficiencies that we already experienced in the process. Those are still real. But to the extent people are expressing disappointment that we don't have the full plan to finish off reforming the NYPD, that's just not, yeah, I, not that's I, not an issue. I appreciate that. Um, are you being listened to? Are your suggestions, and, and remember, you're under oath here. <laughs> No, I'm quite but, serious. So, all right, I'm sorry. I don't mean to laugh. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer by trade. I'm yeah. always under oath as far as I'm concerned talking to my people. I, 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 I'm not going to lie right. to you. So um, there is no, let me, let me answer your question. What you're, you, you hold the kernel of so much information when you talk about risk management. And what you're saying makes so much sense to me as a lay person. What I'm asking is, is, is your, are your recommendations from the things you've learned from risk management being considered as part yeah. of the uh, plan here? So the answer to that is a straight yes. Uh, that, that's easy. Um, we are being uh, collaborative okay. in our conversations. Uh, like everybody at the table, I think I could fix the whole world if people would just listen to me. And 
if every time somebody doesn't, I feel like, oh, that's a shame and that's a, a loss. But no, everybody's contributing here. The risk management discussion that I just had with you is, is not original to me. Uh, I, I've, I've learned it and I've noticed it. And, and I think almost everybody who's on our collaborative would say the same things to you. It just well, happened that I had the answer this way. Here's going to be the difference. You've looked at actual uh, having to settle cases yeah. ever okay. since the new stop and frisk, you know, sure. the, the new Community Safety Act has been sure. implemented. Have sure. you, has, has the risk for those cases diminished appreciably? In, two, in one sense it hasn't, in one sense it hasn't. And you'll hear from the advocate. Certainly the raw numbers are, are re remarkably down just in terms of the, the scope of the program and how many human beings are touched by street encounters by police since the beginning of the program till today. We know the raw numbers are incredibly down. But if you've been reading the monitors report and listening to the advocate groups, you, you know that there are still genuine complaints about the, the proportion of stops and how we have to continue to look at that aspect of it. So have we listened? Yes. Have we finished listening? No. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Seeing no other council members with uh, hands raised, uh, Chair, do you have any more questions or comments before we turn to the next panel? I do not. We can excuse this panel. Thank you very much for your testimony today. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, we will now turn to the uh, Civilian Complaint Review Board. And can we just confirm that we have them ready to go? So uh, giving testimony for the CCRB will be Chairman of the Board, Frederick Davey, and also with him will be uh, Executive Director Jonathan Darsh. Um, I will administer the oath to each of you in turn. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and answer all questions honestly and to the best of your ability before this committee today? Uh, Chair Davey. I do. And Executive Director Darsh. I do. Thank you very much. You may now begin with your testimony when the Sergeant at Arms gives you the signal. Time starts now. So uh, thank you, uh, Chair Adams and members of the Public Safety Committee for having us here today. Um, much of what I'm going to say, we've already heard in various ways. So just let me take a couple of minutes to uh, put it all together systematically from CCRB's point of view, and then we'll be happy to answer any questions at the end. So I want to thank you for inviting me to testify today on behalf of the Civilian Complaint Review Board. In response to Executive Order 203, the CCRB found it important to engage in our own process and engage with several stakeholders to make sure civilian oversight was included in the conversation around reform. The CCRB met with the New York City Police Department, held a conversation with CCRB's Youth Advisory Council and the NYPD, and hosted an oversight um, a panel with the Office of Inspector General and the Commission to Combat Police Corruption. In all three conversations, the CCRB focused on concrete recommendations that would improve the role of oversight in New York City. When speaking with the NYPD, the board and I shared our recommendations for changes the department could make to improve policing, better serve the public, and strengthen the work of, of the agency. First, the department should provide CCRB with greater access to evidence, including direct body-worn camera footage, unredacted police paperwork, and access to officers' entire disciplinary histories. Secondly, the department should give more deference to CCRB's discipline recommendations by not downgrading final discipline recommendations, refraining from changing plea agreements, and by upholding verdicts. Finally, the department should focus on improving interactions with the public, particularly in light of the summer Black Lives Matter protests in response to the killing of George Floyd and the NYPD response, which resulted in hundreds of complaints being filed with the agency, which we continue to investigate. We believe the NYPD needs to look closely 
at the way officers interact with members of the public, including protesters, individuals with mental health crises, and youth. The department should ensure all officers, not just youth coordination officers, get trained on the difference between interacting with adults and youth. And finally, ensuring that the civilians don't face any retaliation for filing complaints with the CCRB. In order to make sure our young leaders, including those who have been victims of police misconduct, were involved in the conversation, the CCRB staff organized a conversation with, the youth, with CCRB's Youth Advisory Council and community leaders, and they were able to share their ideas with the department. The youth, including individuals from the Rockaway Youth Task Force, Crew Count, Sikh Coalition, and Muslim Community Network, shared recommendations they believe would improve police interactions with the public. First, they would like the department to make an effort to engage with the community proactively before enforcement. Second, these young people ask the department to make efforts to reach out to communities of faith and other young people by providing cultural sensitivity training, training on youth for all officers and the incorporation of critical race theory in the academy. Finally, the Youth Advisory Council and those youth leaders ask for a reallocation of NYPD resources to community programs, including more guidance counselors, edu educators, and social workers, as well as increased funding for after-school opportunities for youth, including sports and arts. Finally, the CCRB convened a panel to ensure the importance of oversight and public safety remained a key part of the conversation. During the oversight panel, which was joined by 45 oversight, nonprofit, and advocacy groups from around the nation, the three agency heads shared some similar goals, including better funding for oversight, greater transparency into police discipline, and for greater deference to be given to the recommendations of the oversight bodies. The agency heads focused on issues like removing final discipline from the police commissioner, creating a more independent OIG, NYPD, and ensuring the department respond to the commission to combat police corruption's recommendations. The panel also discussed the lack of transparency from the department and the need for better access by oversight agencies, the public, and the press to NYPD documents, footage, and discipline files. In order to address the particular needs of communities of color to promote public safety, improve community engagement, and foster trust, the CCRB believes there needs to be a civilian-centered approach that is transparent, effective, and equitable. Part of that solution will be a real investment in and reimagining of strong civilian oversight. To that end, the agency's final recommendations focus on concrete solutions to accomplish that goal. First, strengthening civilian oversight by examining the final disciplinary authority held by the police commissioner including the removal of final disciplinary authority for CCRB adjudicated cases. Second, making the police disciplinary process more transparent, including the CCRB with direct body worn camera access, I'm sorry, direct access to body worn camera footage. And third, investigate, investing in the community and community led solutions ensuring and ensuring appropriate funding for those uh, community-led solutions. These changes would support the NYPD and any police department in ensuring that all of its citizens are treated fairly and justly by officers sworn to protect them in, the in line with the governor's, quote, say their name agenda, end quote, and would guarantee that oversight remains an integral part of public safety conversations. I thank you for this time and I'm willing, along with Executive Director Jonathan Darsh uh, to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Davey. Uh, I, I just have a couple of, of questions. Uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, you mentioned the interaction uh, with the Youth Advisory Council, which, which uh, I, I also believe was a, a great success. Uh, my, my question though is that is that enough engagement for you and for CCRB to feel comfortable right now in 
what that engagement will mean potentially to reform? Uh, the answer is no. I mean, we, we engage within the context of this executive order to make sure that we have the perspectives of the youth um, within the time frame that this executive order uh, sets out for getting information and then making those recommendations. Um, uh, I assume that would be to the governor's office. Uh, but we will continue uh, to engage with the Youth Advisory Council and those other youth agencies that were uh, a part of that discussion. Um, as you, you know, statistics will show that engagement with youth by police officers and particularly young youth, youth of color uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a significant issue uh, here in the city. And, uh, and so this, you know, part of CCRB's mission is, uh, is to improve community police relations. And, and that starts with young people and trying to improve that trust between the two. But that's an ongoing uh, process. Um, and uh, we have a, a community engagement and intergovernmental un uh, relations unit uh, that will continue to reach out to those young people. We have a good staff uh, that works on doing that. So this is a start. Um, and uh, I did have a conversation with Deputy Commissioner uh, Chauncey Parker, and I think uh, uh, Chief, the Chief of Community Affairs, if I'm under, if I have his title right, uh, I think it's Jeff Madry, about ongoing conversations between police officers and our young people, so structured, engaged conversations. So that's a start. It was done in the context of this executive order to get recommendations for them but we'll continue to engage on people. It's very crucial and important to the work that we do. Okay, great. Uh, I don't know if you were uh, listening last, last month when uh, former council member Torres and I did the oversight when it came to racial bias um, and uh, within the NYPD. Now, my, my question has to do with uh, violations of 203-32. Do you conduct investigations of violations of 203-32 that fall under offensive language? John, do you wanna uh, grab this? Is that racial profiling? Yes, a hate speech. Hate, well, speech we do, uh, language we do, uh, yes. So if it's hate speech by officers directed at civilians and we get complaints of that, yes, we the, the agency investigates that. Do you have any idea how often that happens? Uh, we have lots of uh, abusive um, language um, complaints. Uh, we can get you numbers on uh, what those look like. And generally it has to do, they have to do with race, sex, gender, gender identity, uh, and perceived um, mental health conditions among others. To your, Mr. Chair, I'm sorry, yeah. Executive Director, go ahead. If you give me one minute, I can pull the number sure. of allegations sure. of offensive language for you from, two, from 2020. So it, we received uh, 277 allegations of, uh, of offensive language allegations in 2020, which is down from 310 in 2019. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll turn the table just a little bit on that question. Um, do you know of any instances, same instances, actually being reported by an officer on behalf of a member of the public? So officers who have, I'm sorry, filed a complaint uh, mm -hmm. on behalf of a member of the public against another officer for using uh, offensive- Correct, language. correct. I don't recall any, John. I don't know if it was for offensive language, but I, I believe I know of one uh, complaint by a member of service on, on behalf of, of a civilian. Okay. We can clearly check and have an answer for you by, by the end of the week. Great. 
Great. Uh, I'd be curious to know that answer. And, and just to kind of uh, wrap this, this will be my, my final question. And just the bottom line, are you, uh, as a leadership of CCRB, um, confident or do you have faith in the reform that's due under this executive order? I'm not. Uh, so I, I'm willing to work with, um, and I think I can speak for my uh, fellow board members, and I think I can speak for the executive staff of CCRB. We, we want to work with the mayor, the governor, the commissioner, the city council, the state legislature, anyone who is pushing uh, for progressive reform. And so what um, I'm hopeful for is that we'll get a, a, a very robust reform agenda uh, coming out of this process and that we will all uh, commit together uh, to uh, seeing to its uh, implementation. Okay, thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Council? Okay, I'll now ask if any other council members have questions for the CCRB before we turn it over to the public. Thank you very much, Mr. Davey and Mr. Darsh. Thank you. Madam Chair, can I just say one thing? Yes. So I, there was, uh, I was listening earlier and there was a lot of conversation about consolidating the three entities uh, into one. And I think while that is an interesting idea, if some of the root uh, problems that the chair discussed in his testimony aren't also addressed, the consolidation won't be a meaningful improvement. Thank you very much, Executive Director. Appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, um, we will now turn to uh, public testimony. I would like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Please begin your testimony once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in the order you raise your hand after the panelist has completed their testimony. Council members, you will have a total of three minutes to ask your question and receive an answer from the panelists. For panelists, once your name, once you're called to testify, a member of our staff will unmute you and the sergeant at arms will set the timer, then give you the go ahead to begin. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I'll just uh, read the names of the first few panelists um, so you can get ready. Uh, first up will be Kadiata Kaba uh, from Make the Road New York, followed by My Michael Sisiski from uh, the New York Civil Liberties Union and Melissa Moore from the Drug Policy Alliance. Um, Kadiata Kaba. Time starts now. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Kadiata, and I'm a member of the Youth Pirate Project at Make the Road New York. Um, for me, this is personal. I grew up watching people who look like me experience and resist violent actions and abuse at the hands of the police. Our city has overinvested in policing instead of investing in things that can actually save our lives and help us thrive. So health care, schools, community centers, housing, mental health supports, food justice, the list goes on. Um, so I'd miss the ongoing cases of police violence throughout the country. Police reform has been a salient issue, but for those of us who reside in these communities directly impacted by, police, by policing, know that this is our everyday lived experiences. Um, we are sick, we are tired, we are exhausted, we have had enough. So when having conversations about police reform, those who are directly impacted must spearhead the conversations about policy advocacy efforts. So police reform must include removing police from public institutions that are supposed to be supporting black and Latinx youth and communities. We know our history and understand police have been in New York City public schools to criminalize, surveil, and restrict freedoms of black and Latinx youth. There is no evidence that police or metal detectives create safer communities, but there is evidence it further criminalized black and Latinx youth. Black and Latinx youth are over 90% of all students arrested and receiving summons in schools. Research shows policing students in schools doesn't do anything to make schools safer, but it leads to the pathway to prison. 
We have a vision for creating nurturing, supportive, and inclusive schools for all young people. And the way to truly create safe and supportive learning environments is by investing in creating stronger relationships between students and supportive school staff, teachers, and guidance counselors, and using more just and fair approaches to discipline that uses community building practices, not policing school children, by re redirecting over 320 million we send from the DOE to the NYPD for school safety agents, we could hire more guidance counselors, social workers, school nurses, and restorative justice coordinators. Um, and the city of Oakland recently announced the complete removal of police officers in schools. So my question is, what are you waiting for in New York City? Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next up will be Michael Sosicki, followed by Melissa Moore and Charlotte Pope. Your time starts now. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Sosicki. I'm senior policy counsel with the New York Civil Liberties Union. For this reform and reinvention process to work, it needs to be informed and led by those whose safety is most directly impacted by police violence. And that's not what we've seen so far. In October, the NYPD held a series of listening sessions announced with no real notice and with limited opportunity for real public engagement. And since then, there's not been a good faith effort to develop a plan in consultation with directly impacted communities. And so we're deeply skeptical that any city run or facilitated process can produce a plan that rises to the current moment. The amount of work that's needed is far beyond what can realistically be accomplished by the April 1st deadline or even by the July 1st city budget deadline, where this body has the opportunity to make up for last year's failure to reduce the size, scope, and power of the NYPD. Uh, but moving forward, defunding the NYPD and reinvesting in black and brown communities must be the goal that guides this council's work. That should be uh, what guides the council's budget deliberations this summer, and it should serve as the framework for analyzing any reforms due by April 1st. This framework means ending the role of police in responding to situations like mental health crises and homeless outreach, and recognizing that we cannot substitute police for a fully functioning and fully funded social safety net. It means a full removal of school safety agents from schools. Uh, former Mayor Giuliani's decision to give cops free reign over school discipline has hurt a generation of black and brown students, and it must come to an end. And merely moving these officers to DOE is not sufficient. This framework also means being uh, banning expensive, invasive, and racist surveillance technologies like face recognition, which we've learned that the NYPD has been using irresponsibly for years. And it also means rejecting proposals for reform that merely entrench the role of policing or that seek to promote better policing. Although often pursued with good intentions, reforms consisting of more training or the rollout of community policing models only legitimize the role of police in areas where alternative social interventions can better address and meet people's needs. And lastly, and perhaps most critically for this process, it can only succeed if we clearly acknowledge and account for the complete lack of credibility from the NYPD and this administration in any conversation on reform. Under this administration, the NYPD has loudly objected to basic transparency measures and has sought to delay or water down nearly every bill that city legislators have put forward. Under this administration, the NYPD pushed for and won a dramatic expansion of Section 50A, which was only undone due to the unprecedented mobilization of thousands of New Yorkers last summer demanding the law's repeal. Under this administration, NYPD officers have misrepresented crime data and broken rules against political messaging while in uniform to advocate for rollbacks of historic bail reform measures. And under this administration, we have seen a complete unwillingness to hold the officers accountable for egregious misconduct from the five years that it took to fire the officer who killed Eric Garner to the repeated failures to take responsibility for the unprecedented violence directed at protesters last summer. The council, um, can, the council can and must serve as a counterweight to this abdication of leadership and work directly with the communities impacted by policing to identify real solutions and not give undeserved credit to whatever reform proposals emerge from the NYPD and this administration. The people with the credibility here are the ones who have been harmed, not the ones who have caused it. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, we will now turn, um, I believe we have Marianne Kashian. If you're available, we're gonna turn to you. Time starts now. 
Thank you. As Senior Policy Counsel with Brooklyn Defender Services, I want to thank the Committee on Public Safety, particularly Chair Adams, for holding this important discussion on police reform and for prioritizing the testimony of family members first. Reforming the NYPD has been attempted many times in the past, but the department only makes a mockery of introspection and change. They amend their patrol guide and conduct trainings to reflect changes demanded by the public, only to fail to discipline officers who break the rules. As now, the NYPD cuts impacted people, critical voices, and defenders out of discussions about police practices while touting so-called efforts at reform. Proposed police reforms across the country, including federal stand standards advocated by Governor Cuomo, would bring other departments into line with the NYPD, such as on body-worn cameras and chokehold bans. But these rules do not curb abuse perpetrated by the NYPD in times of mass protest or otherwise. Ultimately, the NYPD refuses to discipline or fire officers such as Wayne Isaacs or Coble Clouseau, and they reject any and all attempts at oversight. The real transformative change New Yorkers need requires taking power, money, and headcount away from the NYPD and investing in the people of this city. I refer this committee to my written testimony for more information, but in my limited time, I'd like to make the following recommendations. The council controls NYPD funding and must divest from policing. There are many ways the NYPD budget could be significantly and quickly reduced, namely firing officers credibly accused of misconduct, including the murders of family members of people on this call, eliminating the NYPD gang database and abolishing abusive specialized units. Officers engage in misconduct knowing the department will not hold them accountable and the commissioner retains veto power over any disciplinary recommendations. The council must take away the NYPD's final say in the employment of abusive cops who are continually funded at the expense of communities. Massive resources are also spent on surveillance and gang policing without measurable safety improvements. 99% of all people on the NYPD's rogue gang database are non-white. There are no clear guidelines for designation and it can't be challenged. About a third of people added are children, some as young as 12. The database in my experience representing young New Yorkers is railed with errors. But even when the police correctly identify someone as a gang member, the abuse, harassment, and cataloging of young people by police does not enhance community safety. The NYPD surveils children and young adults sometimes for years without alerting parents that their children are in trouble or providing meaningful interventions. They build cases in back rooms to warehouse people for complex and racist prosecutions of inchoate crimes. The council should move to eliminate the gang database and to rein in abusive NYPD practices and it should look to fund community initiatives such as cure violence, housing, and mental health programs instead. In addition to the gang squad, the vice unit and other specialized units operate with impunity. While the abuses by vice covered in recent reporting are not unique to specialized units, these groups exemplify the most destructive tendencies of policing. BDS addressed the city council in a letter calling for the abolition of vice. We've been sounding the alarm on this unit and others alongside community members for years while the NYPD protected these officers. In short, implementing reforms, specifically NYPD approved reforms, and expecting the department to fundamentally change is a folly. The city council should exercise its power to significantly reduce the power and funding of the NYPD. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We'll now return to the list I'd read earlier. Next up will be Melissa Moore, followed by Charlotte Pope, and then Ju Hyun Kang. Um, Melissa Moore. Time starts now. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak at today's much needed hearing. For decades, we've seen the harms of over-policing up close in our work to end the marijuana arrest crusade in New York. We've watched as policing has played a pivotal role in the racist drug war and how resources have been funneled into law enforcement instead of vital services that make our communities safer. In too many cases, drugs have been used by the NYPD, the largest and most militarized police force in the United States as an excuse to target, harass, and assault and kill black New Yorkers. New York City must act in this historic moment to fundamentally change the paradigm around policing in New York, cut the NYPD's budget and reallocate those resources to the more relevant city agencies, harm reduction programs and community-based organizations who are better trained and equipped to actually keep our communities safe. On drugs in particular, New York City criminalizes drugs and low level broken windows offenses at a startling rate with enforcement in these areas accounting for a vast proportion of the NYPD's policing activities and the city's budget. It's inappropriate and ineffective to use law enforcement as frontline healthcare providers. Those resources should instead be allocated to health serving agencies and entities immediately. As we heard earlier this morning from families who have lost loved ones at the hands of NYPD, 
Interactions between the PD and communities go horrifically wrong far too often, and it's time to end this contact. In 2019, there were more than 21,000 drug enforcement arrests and violations in New York City, with two thirds being for only possession of marijuana, a controlled substance or paraphernalia. Further, nearly 15,000 summonses were issued by the NYPD for marijuana in 2019, accounting for 17% of all criminal summonses issued citywide that year. There are stark racial disparities among these drug arrests and violations as well, despite data showing similar rates of use across populations. In 2019 alone, more than 45% of people arrested or cited for drug offenses in New York City were Black, despite Black New Yorkers making up under 25% of the city's total population. A further 38% were Latinx, with Latinx people making up less than 30% of the city's total population. Only 11% of people arrested or cited for drug violations were white, yet white people comprise 47% of the city's population. The trends in drug enforcement in New York City mirror enforcement of other low-level offenses, often referred to as broken windows policing. Because broken windows focuses on the lowest level offenses to theoretically prevent more serious offenses, an assumption that has been repeatedly disproven, low-level marijuana possession and sale are consistently among the most common offenses charged under broken windows as well. Um, and in 2019, the arrests and violations for low-level broken windows offenses accounted for 28% of all NYPD arrests and violations issued for the year, resulting in a tremendous negative impact on individuals and communities and wasting vast city resources. I'll just direct the council to our further recommendations that'll be included in my written testimony, but top level, and the arrest and violation level enforcement for drugs, drug paraphernalia, and related petty offenses often used to criminalize drug use and enacting non-enforcement policies to effectively decriminalize drugs in New York City, eliminate nuisance complaints and remove the odor of marijuana as a justification for a stop and a search, prohibit sweeps of homeless encampments and shift calls for service relating to encampment quote unquote nuisance violations, principally to civilian agencies, establish overdose prevention centers and safer consumption sites and allow drug checking services and eliminate the narcotics unit of the NYPD and reinvest that funding in harm reduction services. We have to stop the use of confidential informants for narcotics by prohibiting the use of known drug users as buyers and informants. And with that, I will close out and thank you very much for this opportunity and for the work that you're doing. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next up will be Charlotte Pope, followed by Ju Hyang Kong, followed by Keith Fuller. Time starts now. Thank you and good afternoon, Chair Adams and members and staff of the committee. My name is Charlotte Pope speaking on behalf of Girls for Gender Equity. Uh, we've submitted detailed written testimony with recommendations for the council's consideration, but we'll share now some abbreviated concerns with school policing and the youth policing strategy. To start, while every public school student in New York City attends a school with a school safety agent, over 87,000 students attend a school without a full-time counselor, over 300,000 without a full-time social worker, over 286,000 with class sizes above 34 students, and the list goes on. The governor's guidance book on the executive order only goes as far as to suggest considering the deployment of police in schools and revising memorandums of understanding. New York City's newest 2019 memorandum of understanding was a result of multiple years of stalling and negotiations that ultimately undermined its potential impact and left school policing to the discretion of the NYPD through the inclusion of language like use alternatives when possible, where appropriate, and on a case-by-case -case basis. In the year that followed the adoption of that MOU, total reported police interventions in schools did not budge from the prior year. So we're calling on the council to advocate for immediately reducing the power and presence of school policing and to move a vision that healthy, equitable schools are police-free schools, rather than continuing to tinker around the edges or building up new policing infrastructure or policing by another name. We're also calling for the end of the NYPD's youth strategy and attempts to further entrench law enforcement in the day-to-day -day lives of young people. With the incorporation of the new youth coordination officer and the patrol guide at the end of June, we're disturbed to read many of the written responsibilities, such as developing youth programs. We're asking that the city invest in meeting the needs of young people rather than packing resources into precincts. We observed each of the nine public facing community engagement sessions and were alarmed by the department's insistence on growing and expanding NYPD youth programs. This comes, for example, after the city defunded DYCD and chopped SYEP in more than half. 
We urge the council to block any attempt to expand the reach of NYPD youth programs and join again in calling for a divestment from youth policing and an investment in meeting the real material needs of young people. Thank you again for this time. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Ju Hyun Kong, followed by Keith Fuller. Time starts now. Thanks so much, Chair Adams, for having this hearing and also certainly for having families speak first. Um, it's so appreciated and so uncommon, unfortunately. Uh, Communities United for Police Reform is a uh, largest coalition in New York City around police reform. We run coalitions of over 200 organizations on various campaigns specifically around police reform and reducing reliance on police for safety. Um, I did have prepared remarks, which I am not going to use because the I'm using my time instead to respond to what I believe are misleading and false statements by the administration this morning. Um, specifically, uh, as you pointed out, the city's process uh, really has been NYPD led. It actually does not matter that the first deputy mayor's office's name is there or that his staff are there. The NYPD has been driving the entire city's uh, reform process, which basically makes it illegitimate. Um, and the moment that we're in right now is that what will happen, as you know, is that the city is required to send a plan to Governor Cuomo by April 1st, which means the city council needs to act by March. And we are in the middle of January, which means that there is no time actually for significant uh, direction or guidance in such a plan. And it's a catch-22 that the council has been set up in, I believe, where had the council been engaged earlier, had community organizations, especially those with longstanding history around police reform, uh, been able to help guide some of this process, we would not be in a position where on in March, you'll have the choice of either accepting or rejecting the mayor's plan um, and having not only the NYPD potentially lose uh, budget uh, monies, but other agencies in the city potentially lose budget monies. And so I just want to name that this is actually in this moment a setup um, regardless. Second thing is that there is really no meaningful engagement that's happened with families, as you've heard from families today. Um, and the question actually isn't fundamentally about engagement, it's a question of power. When we think about past processes, Thomas Giovanni talked about Floyd and Daniels, CPR organizations were actually the lead plaintiffs in Floyd and Daniels. We have a 20 plus year history on the, on, uh, the Stop and Frisk litigation and the Black Latino Asian Caucus was a key supporter of the Floyd litigation. But when we talk about engagement, there were, hunt, there were thousands of New Yorkers who engaged in the Floyd joint remedies process. There were focus groups, there were town halls, and there were hundreds of pages produced of recommendations. And yet the NYPD has really not moved any of the priority recommendations, nor has the mayor. The second, the next thing I wanna just say is that fundamentally, again, this is truly about power more than it is about policy. The NYPD and police unions have outsized power in New York and too often unilaterally reject or block discipline. They reject or block policy changes and they control the media narrative and too often not only mislead, but actually just lie. There's three examples I want to raise that are relevant to the administration. Hard. One is, sorry, did you say that, Sam? Continue. Sorry. One is specifically around 50A. They claim that the um, that there is a TRO currently. Actually, CPR is an intervener in that litigation. It's not so much that there's a TRO, but the police unions have all uh, sued on this. And we actually won and did not have a TRO in the a district court. So the police unions went to the Second Circuit. There's going to be actually a hearing in Second Circuit next week on this. But in spite of that, whether or not we call it a TRO or not, they are not prohibited from releasing individual information, for example, to families or even for that matter for, to the public. So in the next month, I really hope that the council does not accept if they come back and say, we can't tell you what's happening with the officers with Muhammad Bao. We can't tell you what's happening with the officers with Island Police. We can't tell you about Delron Small or Trey Wick or, or Eric Garner because of supposed 50A restrictions. That is not actually true. Second example is just the cosmetic changes around the matrix. They, they mentioned the matrix this morning. And what I want to uh, emphasize is that there is a way in which legislation can be very important. And there is a way in which the NYPD has become expert at abusing legislation. And so, yes, there is a matrix that's been mandated. However, what goes into that matrix is completely unilaterally determined by the NYPD. So, for example, we sent a letter signed by dozens of organizations uh, demanding changes to the matrix because abusive actions like not wearing your mask, like racial profiling, like other kinds of abusive actions 
are not necessarily automatically fireable offenses. That's already a problem when you consider the fact that racial profiling complaints in a span of five years from 2014 to 2019, there are oh, close to 3,000 racial and discriminatory profiling complaints. Zero were substantiated by the NYPD, zero. And so if the NYPD itself is not going to substantiate these complaints, it will never result in firing. The third example is around the monitorship that Thomas Giovanni talked about. Yes, many of us have been involved in the Floyd monitorship. In fact, many of our organizations, including those uh, members of the Malcolm X grassroots movement and the Justice Committee, were lead plaintiffs, not only in Floyd, but also in the Daniels lawsuit after Amadou Diallo was, was killed. However, in that monitorship, what's being contested right now is that we have 20 years of litigation with almost no remedy. There's been no, not, there have been zero disciplinary reforms that have been ordered. The community prioritized recommendations that the Floyd facilitator recommended in his official report before his term was over, those have not been moved on, including the creation of a specific community board. Um, and then lastly, I guess I just wanna say that Chair Adams, your question early in the hearing, uh, questioning the point about how this is a leadership issue and that the refusal to admit wrongdoing is a bottom line in this process and the lack of action for families, I would say really means that there can't be any faith in any plan that comes out of this without significant city council intervention and without significant leadership, not only from the families involved, but also communities who've been fighting this for decades. Not just the, the Sorry, the last point I just wanna make is just community engagement is not the same as community power. And what we are looking for is a shift in power. That's why so many people are calling for a reduction in the budget of the NYPD because that represents a reduction in the unchecked power of the NYPD. Thank you so much. And I really apologize for going over. No apology necessary. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'll just remind any council members if you have questions for any of the panelists, um, please use the Zoom hand raise function. And the next few witnesses will be Keith Fuller, followed by Justine Olderman, followed by Corey Stoughton, and Albert Fox Khan. The next panelist will be Keith Fuller. I'm sorry. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, my name is Keith and I'm a member of Make the Road New York's Youth Power Project. And lately I've been doing a lot of personal uh, reflection. So I really want to start this off by emphasizing that the reality for many people that look like me is we live in two Americas, one in which people are propped up by the policing infrastructure and another America where people are weighed down by the very same um, infrastructure. And there's no coincidence that the groups that are oppressed come from black Latinx communities. That's why it's so crucial that our electeds wake up and acknowledge that the only way we can effectively reimagine policing is by reducing their budget, power, and reach into our lives. The insurrection at the Capitol building on Wednesday should have put everyone on notice. The core functions of the NYPD and law enforcement across this country is the maintaining of inequality and upholding of white supremacy. The mayor is not willing to address that directly, making the city's process a hollow one, one that we can't trust to bring us justice. Compare what we saw in the Capitol to the Black Lives Matter protests across the city this summer that were outraged that a black or brown person cannot sleep in their own beds at night without the fear of being woke up, woken up and murdered by the police. They were, we were beaten, sprayed and drove down on by police cars. And that is why I call it Two Americas because police are here to control us and to aid them. So let's address this directly, not by using our imagination, but by addressing the reality. We can start by significantly reducing the NYPD budget by removing them from all forms of social services, public institutions, homeless outreach and mental health responses. Police have been embedded in social services, largely serving black and Latinx communities, not to improve them, but because we are seen as dangerous and criminal, even when we are trying to access support. In short, immediately remove police from our social services and their relationships with social service agencies and reinvest that same money that went to the NYPD back into the communities that need them the most. That is how we keep our community safe and just. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next up will be Justine Olderman, followed by Corey Stoughton. 
Chairperson Adams and committee members, I know I'm not just speaking for myself when I thank you for having this hearing and for your opening remarks. It is a relief in many ways to hear reflected back by council the concerns that we have been raising with the mayor and with the police department since October. I'm the executive director at the Bronx Defenders, and at the Bronx Defenders, we represent over 15,000 people charged with criminal cases every year. Every single one of the people that we encounter before we meet them has had some interaction with the NYPD. And when I try to sort of wrap my head around how monumental the task is of reinventing the role of police in New Yorkers' lives, what I think about is if we took every single one of those stories, if we wrote them down, if we put them in books and we bound those books and stacked them one on top of each other and put them down in front of one police plaza, it would be a physical monument to what is essentially city sanctioned brutality. And it would be a stunning indictment, not only of the brutality of the NYPD, but sadly a city that has really stood by for a very long time and done nothing about it. So it's not surprising that this summer, as you referenced in your opening remarks, in the aftermath of George Floyd's murder, that the decades of pain and trauma that New Yorkers, especially Black and Brown New Yorkers, have experienced, it, it spilled over into the streets. And what we all stood by and heard and experienced and participated in were the cries of anguish and of urgency for transformation. And when confronted, with that mounting critique of the role of NYPD in the violence they perpetuate against low-income Black and Brown communities, what did they do? What they did, Chairperson, is they did what they do best. They responded with militarized force and more violence. And nowhere was that more on display than in the South Bronx, where the people we serve live. Our clients, our staff, our community members, they were there in Mott Haven on June 4th. They not only witnessed the brutality, they experienced it. One of our senior attorneys and a Bronx resident reported this. I was hit on the head with a shield and indirectly sprayed with pepper spray. I tried to use my body to get out of the way of officers who were hitting people with batons and shields. And I was pushed into a crushed bodies and could not move. I'd love to sit here and tell you that the stories we heard in the aftermath of the Mott Haven protests were surprising to us, but having worked in the South Bronx for 20 years and serving this community, there was nothing surprising about it. For years, the NYPD has targeted the people of the Bronx. The Bronx, which has the highest proportion of people of color, they have been disproportionately targeted for arrest and enforcement in rates we just don't see. In I'm other expired. Now, as you noted, despite this predictable pattern, there was a glimmer of hope that we all had when the governor issued his executive order. It could have been a catalyst for change. It could have been a structured way to reimagine the role of the NYPD in the lives of New Yorkers. However, despite what you heard today, neither the mayor nor the commissioner have had a show any interest in addressing these longstanding patterns of violence and brutality. If chairperson and council members, if what they said today was true, they would have launched a truly collaborative process. You noted the guidelines that the governor put out, a collaborative process that mirrors something like the council's own Rikers Commission that had not only a cross section of, of advocates and stakeholders who participated, but they built that plan together. They didn't just passively listen to what people had to say and then go off in a, in a process that was shrouded in secrecy and come up with their own plan. They could have done that, but they didn't. Instead, the mayor handed over the reins to the NYPD, which has shown itself, we all know this time and again, to have one goal over all others. And it is not public safety. It is self-preservation. I want to highlight one thing that I heard today from the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, this claim that they have engaged with stakeholders, including the defenders. Like Ju Young, I also want to highlight that that is not true. The only role the defenders have played in this is to highlight for them the same concerns you raised at the beginning of this hearing, in letters, in meetings, et cetera. And what was the response? All of our suggestions for how to make this process meaningful were completely rebuffed. 
And so are we willing to be simply a checkbox so they can come before you and say that they engage with us? We are not, because as Ju Young said, this isn't just about listening, this is about power. And I would ask you to inquire not only about what, where are the voices of impacted communities in this process, but where are the nonprofit leaders that you cited, that you respect, that we respect, where were they today? Why are we hearing from them? They should be called upon to speak to your committee as well. If, in fact, the things that they said today were true, they also would have created a transparent process. That process would have conclude, included the sharing of data with the public. All these meetings they trotted out to make it seem like they had done so much. Why weren't those made public? And why didn't they engage in the community with a mean, in a meaningful way? You've heard that these were rushed and rolled out. They were shrouded in secrecy. People didn't have enough in advance notice. Many of us who testified today attended those. They were PR campaigns. They all weren't real engagement sessions and they could have created a system of accountability. But there is no way for us to hold this mayor or the commissioner accountable to the feedback from those meetings. The process that they have set up, as I think you alluded to early on, it is all smoke and mirrors. It gives the illusion of something real when in reality, it is designed to reinforce the status quo. I was so taken by Iris Baez's comment this morning. I think she sort of summed it up best. She said decades ago that the NYPD came and said everything that the community wanted to hear. And they did the same thing to you today. They said the right words. They had the right intentions. But we know when you pull back the veil, this is not a process we can trust and it's not even a process worth having. And I apologize, it leaves me with this moment where I wanna to say to you, this is the answer, this is what you can do. But the truth is I'm not entirely sure what the council can do at this point. In many ways, it is too late for a real process. And in many ways, sadly, it's a, it's a missed opportunity for real change. But the one thing council could do that at least would be a step in the right direction is to reject any plan this mayor brings to you that does not, as many other people have said, and as the impacted members of the family said this morning, that does not have a radical divestment from the NYPD and a corollary massive investment in impacted communities. This is a civil rights issue of our time. And at this point, it is up to the council to make sure that what comes out of this process isn't just another fake reform effort that we can all pat ourselves on the back on and go away and pretend like nothing happened. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for that informed testimony. I was about to put my thumb up, but I figured I'd just take my mic and just say whoop whoop. Um, so, so, uh, I, I, I really just want to ask you and uh, Ms. Kong, if she's still, if she's still on, we're, we're talking about, you know, and you all are some of the most, you know, learned individuals through this whole process, right? Um, what do you think are some of the responsibilities that, that can be transferred from NYPD to non-law enforcement in addition to homeless outreach, in addition to mental health. What are your thoughts on that? Ji Young, I'm gonna let you take that first. And then I'm happy to chime in. Sorry, I was having some technical difficulties around this. I mean, I think anything I say is just representing the brilliance of our members. For me, I don't really have any original ideas myself, but our members have said for a very long time, that uh, a number of places, not only homeless outreach, but homeless services, so all homeless engagement. Uh, when we talk about mental health, it's not only about mental health response for emergency crisis, but when people are perceived to be a mental health crisis, which may not be mental health crisis, it might be drug use, it might be any, it might be somebody got fired that day. Um, but all of those kinds of instances of emotional distress that get perceived as emotional distress, or it might be somebody that has cognitive disability or some other kind of disability that's being misread, that we need to really reduce the amount of police engagement. 
many of our youth organizations and all of them have said the police have to be out of schools. I know that Chair Adams, you were in New York when there was a time when police were not in schools. And there are many reasons for why people will say police are now in schools, but there is no reason we can't actually come up with a comprehensive safety plan in schools that centers young people the centers youth of color who are daily facing punitive impacts in the school to prison pipeline. And if we can listen to groups like Make the Road New York, like Girls for Gender Equity, and really follow their lead in terms of all the work they have thought through around restorative justice, around how to make sure that the purpose of school is not punishment, but the purpose of school is learning. Um, Melissa talked about drug enforcement is another area. Traffic enforcement is another area. There's a number of areas we can go through, but really this is the moment to rethink and imagine what does public safety look like for us as the city and not assume that every part or any part of public safety has to require police in the center. Many of our organizations who um, have members who uh, are regularly survivors of hate violence has said that police should be taken out of hate violence and for uh, hate violence investigations. There's other ways to do hate violence investigation, hate violence prevention that is not purely about police. So there is a long list. And I would say that that's only the beginning of a list that we could actually have a citywide conversation on how to redefine safety and how to rethink how we keep all of our communities safe all of the time. And I'll just, I mean, that's such a great list. The, some things that I will just, you know, add to that, um, you know, one of the things is domestic violence um, and seeing other places where we can actually intervene in ways that actually help people instead of harm people. Um, it's like a one, we've got a, like a one size fits all approach to it. Um, the other issue is even mm. just the interpersonal, the number of cases we see that involve tenants who have conflict with one another, who have disputes with one another. It's like, again, it's like if, if you look at every interaction that happens from all the ones that Ji Young cited to, you know, all the way through to the way we deal with, you know, the vice squad um, and drugs and gangs, it's like we have to ask ourselves, we're such, this city is filled with brilliant people. We are smart enough to come up with alternative solutions and not keep going through the fa same failed strategies. Think about um, HRA centers, the, the places where people go to seek help and assistance, and the, yet those are spaces that are police. So I think, you know, just to echo what Young said, like if we really need to begin to take a very expansive look and ask ourselves, are we smart enough? Are we creative enough? Do we care enough to come up with a different strategy? Because certainly what we've been doing in all of the areas that you just heard from, it's not working. Thank you so much. It looks Thank like uh, Ms. Kong has um, some follow-up. Can we unmute her? I'm so sorry. Just two things that I will get yelled at for not naming. One is press cred credentialing. There is no reason that press credentialing should be happening through the NYPD. That can be moved to another government agency easily. It's an administrative function. Shouldn't be a police function. Secondly, is also uh, policing of protest. The st uh, strategic response group, which is a counterterrorism unit, has no business uh, policing protests, but we would actually go farther and say that community members actually can secure our own protests. In fact, we train people all the time to actually secure their own protests because oftentimes what police are doing at protests is stopping traffic. And that's something that community members can be trained to do as marshals and as in their own uh, safety formations, especially when there's no risk, uh, no threats of violence or, or risk. Uh, sorry about that from before. Thanks. I believe Chair, uh, Council Member Rosenthal has some questions. Chair, did you want to follow up before we turn to her? No, nope, let's go to Council Member Rosenthal. Well, I just want to thank Justine. You know that um, you know how I feel about you. I really appreciate your coming to testify today and, and the defenders, all the defenders' input. I'm wondering two things. One, just out of pure ignorance, has, the co has your coalition put together a response, a formal response that the council should be looking at? Um, I wanna make sure the council has that. And secondly, if you could pick, I, I like how the chair is zeroed in on you know, what functions should not be in the PD you gave this wonderful long list that I agree with. Um, is there one other thing, example you want to give of something where you sat in those stakeholder meetings? And trust me, 
the same thing happens in many on many issues there they have the meeting and they listen but that doesn't mean they do anything about the suggestions so is there one other suggestion that you would like to highlight that you think the pd you know listened to but did not hear um, Council Person Rosenthal, just so that I'm, I'm sure that um, I am responding to your question in terms of the process or in terms of what we think a reimagined role for policing should or could be. I mean, the way you articulated the process, I think, spoke for itself, not transparent um, and not meaningful. And I sat in I, on some of those Zooms as well and heard the same old defensive reactions, you know, an attempt not to, but the same old defensive reactions to community suggestions, but specifically suggestions that you would have to reforming, to reimagining, to be thinking about the police as uh, neighborhood safety instead of what they are now. Is there a suggestion that you made that you wish the, you know, in one of those stakeholder meetings that you wish they really would do? Yeah, to be honest, we didn't even get to any substantive engagement on recommendations or what we think should be included in the plan. Um, because it became very clear very early on. And, and to be honest, just to give you probably more history than you want, in the beginning, we were told it was going to be a collaborative process, much the way that the Rikers Commission was, that we would not only be part of the collaborative, but we would be part of the process of drafting the plan. And obviously any input we had, we would want you know, to also be informed by the people we serve, the people of, of the Bronx. Um, that didn't happen. And so as soon as it became clear Clear that that wasn't going to happen and our engagement was only to sort of check the box and be able to come before a body like yours and say we engaged I'm with hard. we indicated that we were not interested in in that process so what we're going to be doing and what i think many of us have really no choice but to be doing is to be able to create sort of an external process to get you the information that you need about how you should think about any plan that comes out and once a plan does come out you know, hopefully it'll come out with enough time for impacted communities to, to have their voices raised and heard about what they actually think of what's in that document or, or whatever comes before you. I do think that if there is any one, um, you know, sort of uh, area that we would really push for, and this was referenced by a speaker earlier today, it is a real divestment, not a divestment in that name only, not a shell game that moves some departments under a different heading, but does not radically reimagine the role of policing. And there is, I'm glad that, you know, you asked the question and, um, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you directly, because one thing you talked about earlier was sort of this policing social work model. And I, I I do want the opportunity to lift up that, um, and I think somebody responded to this in, in kind, and I want to reiterate it, is that we do not see social work policing collaboration as the answer. Right. Having police officers show up in these venues that that Jiyoung and I just, you know, sort of outlined and having a social worker in tandem or a social worker who works for the NYPD, that is still approaching a societal issue, a human problem, a human interaction from a punitive standpoint. There are no, no number of social workers, no matter how well trained they are, accompanied by a police officer is going to create the kind of culture shift that we've been talking about. We need to, to to divest, we need to shrink radically, and we need to build alternate systems for addressing the issues that we have always had this one size fits all approach to deal with. Yeah, I agree with you completely on that. Um, and But just to be clear, uh, what they do in Finland for the corrections officers is in order to get the corrections training to become an officer, before you go into that academy, you have to spend two years in social work school. So they are trained in being having the mindset of a social worker first um, before they can even learn about. Just to be clear, I wasn't saying both because in the domestic violence, you know, for example, 
there are the sea baths that you know exist in each of the precincts, but they don't have the power that the other police have. So for them to be able to say, you know, gee guys, you're really not responding to people who walk in the door in a trauma informed way, they'd be laughed out of the precinct. Um, so, so yeah, just a meaningful shift in the how how people. Yeah, I appreciate that. I think my only the only red flag I would have on it is to make sure that any effort that is made to ensure that the people who come into this line of work are coming with sort of like that human oriented lens. Exactly. Not instead of a radical reimagining of the role of police in all the areas we just talked about. So, right. It's in addition to. Exactly. exactly. Agreed. Okay. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that and look forward to your response to the plan. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal. We will now turn back to our panelists. Next up will be Corey Stoughton, uh, followed by Albert, Albert Fox Khan, followed by Marinda Van Dalen. Thank you, council members. My name is Corey Stoughton from the Legal Aid Society. Um, the Legal Aid Society is the city's largest and oldest public defense provider, and we also have a COP accountability project and a civil rights practice where we represent clients in actions against the police challenging police misconduct. And I want to join the chorus of thanks to, uh, to the chair uh, for her powerful opening statement and for putting the voices of families up front. Uh, as this committee has already heard powerfully from the families of people killed by police officers this morning, the mayor and the police uh, leadership entered this process with a real deficit of trust and credibility. And that's unfortunate, but it is the widely acknowledged reality. And I can tell you from our work on the front lines with our clients and our community partners that this feeling is really widespread throughout the city. And, and rather than taking some basic confidence building uh, steps to address that deficit and set this process on the right track, the city's process has, process has made it worse. And as one of the named stakeholders in the governor's executive order, the legal, legal aid and I have been a firsthand witness to that failure. Uh, our written testimony provides a run through on those failures. And I think it, it's very clear that in this committee, there's widespread understanding uh, and comprehension of that. Um, but the, you know, the, the committee of stakeholders was, disp disp uh, was convened and then disbanded by the mayor's office. Uh, and, that, uh, and, the, and the listening sessions were turned over to the NYPD uh, in a process that was really designed to create uh, the appearance without the reality of community engagement, leading to widespread condemnation of that process and a, and a further erosion of its legitimacy. And I asked myself as I was listening to the testimony today about how there could be such a gap, uh, you know, almost two realities between the mayor's office and the NYPD's uh, descriptions of the broad-based community engagement and the community's reactions um, to that as kind of inadequate and, and poor. And I think there are a couple of reasons for that. The, the first is that it's very clear from all of this testimony that the NYPD is not only leading this process, but treating it as an opportunity to take feedback. And while that is laudable, that is not what this process is about. It, community should have a direct voice in reform. That is what is contemplated by the executive order. And any meaningful police reform plan would center those voices and not have them mediated through NYPD leadership, uh, which unfortunately doesn't hold the trust of the people whose voices would be mediated through that process. And I think that's a real strategic or tactical miscalculation by the mayor's office and the police to imagine that simply replaying processes of community engagement that they engage in on, an, on the nor in the normal course of business is going to be sufficient to build back up the trust and to really center those voices of community in the police reform plan. Um, the second reason why I think there's such that disconnect between what you're hearing from advocates and what you've heard from um, the executive and NYPD leadership is that there's a question of quality uh, over quantity. And I, I have to question the scale of the engagement that the mayor and the NYPD's witnesses have characterized this morning. Uh, and, and, but, but more importantly, question the quality of it. Uh, you know, this morning, there was a lot made, for example, of engagement with community, with cure violence partners. And Legal Aid is the legal services provider for those cure violence partners. And I can tell you that I was engaged in text messages during the council hearing this morning, a bafflement that the process of meeting with those partners would be held up as a sign of a healthiness in this process. The feedback that we have from our cure violence process is that those meetings seemed more oriented towards getting engagement and buy-in and legitimacy to this process rather than really 
contributing towards further police reform. And that, that echoes the sentiments that we felt, the defenders felt, that, that Justine and Jihoon and I felt when we were initially invited to feedback sessions where again, it, there, it felt more like a check a checkbox exercise as Justine described it, than it felt like a serious engagement. And when we tried in really good faith to write that ship and suggest a series of confidence building measures to really engage community leaders, we were just met with silence and then ultimately an announcement that the committee was over. And that is really damaging to the overall project of building trust and relationships in the police reform process. And it is a real shame that we have ended up in a place where a process that held out so much promise of delivering on the demands that people took us to the street has instead set us back. So I want to have hope and we have a lot of work to do and we have not much time to do it. But I think unless there's, and, and I appreciate the acknowledgement from some of the uh, mayor's offices witnesses that the early stages of the this process weren't great and that change was required. But I think respectfully, the problem is that change has not come. And until it does, there will not be progress and there will not be reform. And it is great that we are getting to the conversation here and we will get to it again as this process unfolds, where we're brainstorming ideas about what community-centered police reform really looks like. But it is a shame that we are once again doing that as advocates and that the voices of community members are having to do that from the outside of this process, talking at the council and talking at the NYPD, instead of the collaborative process that was envisioned by the governor's executive order. And when, until we find a way to interrupt that endless cycle of community voices expressing their needs, expressing their desires, putting forth solutions, and just being put on the outside of that process, until the NYPD and the mayor's office in a process that we still know nothing about, that the council has heard no details about the specifics about at this stage. Until we break that cycle, we will not get police reform. And so I think the action has to be to take a few steps back. And yes, we are on a timeline for April, but I think there has to be an acknowledgement that the city is not gonna make that timeline. Because for a police reform plan to be put before the city council that lacks the legitimacy that it will have, that, that will substantively lack the legitimacy and will process-wise lack the legitimacy isn't going to serve New Yorkers. So we need to find a way to make police reform work. And it really involves taking a couple steps back and taking those confidence building measures and ending that cycle. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next up will be Marinda Van Dalen, followed by Yasmin Harris. Time begins now. Thank you for the opportunity to present testimony today regarding the critical issue of how New York City must respond to people experiencing mental health crises um, by eliminating police from the equation completely. Um, my name is Marinda Van Dalen. I'm an attorney with New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. Thank you to the committee and the uh, speakers today, including the families who spoke first. Um, the city must ensure that people who experience mental health crises receive appropriate services, which will de-escalate the crisis. The most um, appropriate individuals to respond are, of course, mental health advocates and healthcare providers. The police are not suited to deal with these issues. New York's recent history of 16 individuals, 14 of them people of color, um, who were killed by the New York City Police Department while experiencing crises is a sad testament to that. Correct Crisis Intervention Today, NYC, of which NILPI has long been a member, has developed the needed an antidote to this problem. CCIT NYC has drafted a proposal which will provide 24 seven responses to mental health care crises by emergency medical technicians and trained peers, people who themselves have experienced mental health crises, not the police. We encourage the city to adopt this pilot project and not the one that was announced by the city in November. It has greater independence from the New York City Police Department 
and a central role for our communities and people who themselves have had mental health crises. In closing, I would also like to urge the committee and council to do everything within its power to bring the New York City Police Department into compliance with New York's Freedom of Information Law. And in particular, to assure that the public has timely access to body-worn camera footage, which is unedited. New York Lawyers has brought multiple Article 78 proceedings against the police department for such footage. And we've been enormously successful, but there should not be the necessity for a lawsuit and the attendant delays for the public to have access to footage that they're entitled to by law. The footage we obtained of the police killings of Miguel Richards and Susan Muller, who were experiencing mental health crises in their homes um, and were killed by the police, shows the violent and often fatal results of treating mental health crises as criminality. Body-worn camera footage must be promptly available as mandated by FOIL and relevant case law. Thank you for your consideration. Um, I again urge you to urge the city to implement the proposal made by CCIT NYC to eliminate police as first responders to individuals experiencing mental health crises. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next up will be Albert Fox Khan, followed by Maria Rinaldi. Time begins now. Thank you so much for inviting me to testify, Chair Adams and the committee. My name is Albert Fox Khan, and I'm the Executive Director of the Surveillance Technology Oversight Project and a fellow at the Engelberg Center at NYU Law School. And our written testimony will detail a number of steps that need to be taken by the city to remedy this historic buildup of policing technology in the NYPD, banning facial recognition, biometric tracking, real-time intelligence sharing with federal agencies such as ICE. But today, I, I want to direct my oral remarks at, at a far graver threat that here, again, in this process, we see the lost chance to hold police accountable at a time when we know that is so indispensable. And instead, we have let the NYPD take control of this process, a process that any city agency, even this council, could have uh, taken command of from the beginning, pursuant with the governor's executive order. And instead, it was the PD that was allowed to run with this process to derail it, to prevent meaningful oversight, prevent meaningful reforms. And, and it, you know, speaking less than a week after our nation's capital was overthrown and breached in an attack made possible by police indifference to white supremacy and with a mob that had at least some off-duty police officers, perhaps police officers from our own NYPD, we have to do more to hold our police departments accountable to the people they serve. This is not just a public safety matter. This is not just a racial justice matter, as crucial as those are. This is a threat to the heart of our democracy when we fail through our democratically elected institutions to hold police accountable to the people they serve. And if we do not have enough time Given the amount of time that has been wasted in this process by the mayor's office and by the PD to do that through this mechanism, then we need something else. We need to take immediate action because if we do not begin the work today of dismantling the NYPD's stranglehold on our city government, not simply defunding them as crucial as that it is, not simply banning invasive technologies such as facial recognition as crucial that it, as that is, but reasserting the fundamental role of civilian oversight and the people of New York in holding the NYPD accountable. That is going to take reforms to our charter. That is going to take a reinvigorated and re-empowered city council with the tools to 
actively oversee the NYPD. That is going to take a wholly independent disciplinary process. And that is going to take a fundamental shift in the mindset we bring to these conversations. Because it should not be the NYPD that is setting the agenda for their own reform because they have shown all too often that the NYPD cannot be trusted to the police themselves. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony. Next up will be Mary Rinaldi, followed by Yasmin Harris and Carla Rabinowitz. Time begins now. Chair Adams and members of the Committee on Public Safety, as well as other city council members that are in attendance, thank you for this opportunity to testify. I also want to thank you for putting families first and letting us hear their, it's difficult to hear, but important for all New Yorkers to, and for the NYPD and the city council to hear the stories of the people most affected by the lack of accountability at the NYPD. My name is Mary Rinaldi and I'm from GOSO, Getting Out and Staying Out, a nonprofit headquartered in East Harlem that serves justice involved young men citywide. GOSO is a member of Reform NYPD Now Coalition as well. At GOSO, we work with young people impacted by incarceration and arrest. We provide them with tools for educational achievement, employment, and financial independence. GOSO also runs SAVE, a cure violence team working in East Harlem to support a culture of nonviolence. In preparing for this meeting, we thought about first the young men we work with, their families, and their communities, and what their experience with public safety in New York City has been. Much of what many of the members of the public have highlighted here, that young people of color, especially black people, are abused, harassed, cataloged, and surveilled by the NYPD and have been for decades. And it echoes the experiences of GOSO participants from school to their homes, to their play on the streets. For them, public safety is elusive. And this is often because of the over-policing of their communities. We've heard evidence after evidence today that the NYPD does not serve or protect black and brown youth, but instead, put, but instead puts them at risk. And we've also heard today a rebuff of accountability on the part of the NYPD. Racial profiling by the NYPD is alive and well with racial disparities in arrests and summonses widening since the end of stop and frisk. The Civilian Complaint Review Board, whom we heard from today, notes that 64% of civilian complaints against New York City police officers were filed on or behalf of young black people ages eight to 18, who claim to have been mistreated after being stopped for innocuous activities like high-fiving and carrying backpacks. These are not the obvious instances of police brutality, but for young people, this kind of abuse and harassment and fear is deeply traumatizing and harmful. And it also harms all of us who live in New York City as we are connected to each other fundamentally. The CCRB is responsible for investigating police misconduct, but it is hamstrung by its very structures and rules which are imposed by the NYPD and the city. An analysis by the New York Times, which has mentioned, been mentioned here a few times, found that the NYPD has reduced or rejected recommendations from the CCRB for stiff discipline of officers in 71% of almost 7,000 serious misconduct charges. This is not acceptable. This is not accountability. And there can be no reform if there is no accountability first. GOSO wants real accountability from the NYPD, beginning with eliminating the police commissioner review of CCRB decisions and dis discipline recommendations, removing the re requirement for a formal complaint to be filed in order for an investigation of police misconduct to take place, even when evidence of that misconduct is publicly and widely available, and removing the exemption of non-uniformed police officers from misconduct investigations by the CCRB. We ask city council to not just acknowledge that public safety for young black and brown men and youth in NYC is severely compromised by the ongoing lack of accountability and change and reform by the NYPD, but to act upon that acknowledgement. 
much more work is still needed to address systemic inequity in the justice system in our city, but these reforms would be an important step forward. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony. Next up will be uh, Yasmin Harris. Before I turn um, to the next panelist, I just remind any council members, if you have any questions, to utilize the Zoom hand raise function. Uh, next up will be Yasmin Harris, Carla Rabinowitz, and Cal Hedigan. Yasmin Harris. Hello. Um, good evening, everyone, and Chair Adams. My name is Yasmin Harris, and I'm a member of the Anti Violence Project and the um, and I, I'm sorry, I use feminine pronouns and I'm also a member of the New York City Anti-Violence Project and a member of AVP CGNC Leadership Academy. One of the many things we aim to do in my community is to protect each other from harm. We do this because we know the NYPD have not kept us safe and a police reform process from the city won't change that. My community has been historically criminalized and profiled by the police. Like many other transgender and gender nonconforming folks, I have been consistently misgendered by law enforcement, insulted, and harassed. My community has always been a target of stop and frisk, especially those who are involved in survival sex work and even my trans siblings who are perceived as sex workers. How can we trust the NYPD to keep us safe when there are laws such as prosecution for loitering for the purpose of prostitution, excuse me, known as the walking while trans ban, that are systematically oppressive and continue to cr cr criminalize my community. NYPD isn't doing anything to alleviate crimes and the injustices that are going on, especially now in this time of a pandemic and increased protests Police seem to be more empowered to enact violence, especially toward members of the TGNC community. I've gone through the criminal justice system. I've gone through Rikers. And if we only could address the root causes of criminalization, I and others like me would not have gone through the system. The city needs to pay more attention to offering resources instead of spending energy on time and time on further police reform. That just isn't going to Put more, that's just going to put more money in the hands of the NYPD and promote this false notion that police equals safety. The truth is that meeting people's needs equals safety, not policing. We need housing, education, trainings, healthcare, and more job opportunities. Instead of focusing on harassing homeless New Yorkers, why are we not combating homelessness? Programs like the TGNC Leadership Academy at AVP is only one example of how we are creating safety within our communities by building relationships, meeting needs, and taking care of each other. We, the de we demand the reallocation of NYPD funds to community-based organizations and to community-centered social services and public health. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, up next will be Carla Rabinowitz, followed by Cal Hedigan, followed by Jasmine Bowden. Carla Rabinowitz. Do we have Carla Rabinowitz? Let's go to Cal Head again. We'll see if we can. We don't, we don't hear you, uh, Ms. Rabinowitz. Um, Carla, I don't think we can hear you. We are going to uh, turn to Cal Hedigan and we'll circle back when we can um, get that issue fixed. Cal Hedigan. Good afternoon, Chair Adams and members of the committee. My name is Cal Hedigan and I'm the CEO of Community Access, a nonprofit that expands opportunities 
for people living with mental health concerns to recover from trauma and discrimination through supportive housing, job training, advocacy, and healing focused services. Thank you for convening this hearing. New York City, as a progressive leader, should be a model when it comes to addressing the harms caused by the collision of law enforcement with people experiencing mental health crises. Sadly, we are not. For nearly a decade, community access through the CCIT NYC coalition has been leading an effort to transform the city's police response to people experiencing emotional crises. Systemic change is needed to develop a healthcare response and remove law enforcement as first responders. Over the last five years, as has been mentioned, 16 New Yorkers experiencing a mental health crisis died in police encounters. All but two of the 16 were people of color. This is more than double the number killed during the preceding eight years, despite the fact that more than 15,000 NYPD officers received crisis intervention training to learn how to best respond under these very circumstances. Each year, there are close to 200,000 mental health crisis calls to 911. Not counted in the statistics of those killed are the hundreds of people who experience trauma or are otherwise harmed when being confronted by armed law enforcement officers, well-trained in command and control techniques. In too many cases, police actions escalate rather than resolve the very crises that they are being asked to address. People in crisis need human compassion, someone to listen, to understand what is happening from their perspective. This is not the job of law enforcement. New York City must learn from successful non-police models operating in other parts of the country, such as the 30-year-old CAHOOTS program in Eugene, Oregon. And any model we adopt must include peers, people with lived experience within the mental health system as part of the response. Peers trained in crisis response and de-escalation techniques are uniquely qualified to connect with people experiencing a crisis and partner with them to get the support they need. The killing of New Yorkers experiencing mental health crises must stop. The need to transform this system is urgent. It is past time for the city to work expeditiously with advocates, peers, and community leaders to craft a crisis response system that relies on mental health teams rather than law enforcement as first responders. Without system transformation, it is a matter of when, not if, the next person will die. We can do better and we must. Lives are at stake. I'm expired. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. And thank you for your testimony. Um, we will, let's go back to Carla Rabinowitz, see if we've got that issue resolved, followed by Jasmine Bowden. Clock is ready. Carla, can you try speaking? Let's see if we can hear you. Okay, let's move. Let's move on to Jasmine Bowden. We'll try to come back again. Clock stands ready. Um, good afternoon, um, Chair, Chair Adams and the Committee on Public Safety. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Jasmine. I use he, she pronouns and I'm a member at the New York City Anti-Violence Project and currently in AVP's TGNC Leadership Pro Academy. I want to highlight some of the harms of policing both in the wider LGBTQ and HIV affected communities, as well as my own personal experience and offer alternatives to the city policing reform process. AVP is an organization that serves and works to empower lesbians, gay, 
bisexual, queers, trans, gender non-conforming, and HIV-affected communities. AVP does not does this through social services such as counseling and advocacy. As a member of AVP and an a TGNC New Yorker, I have seen our community be profiled and targeted by law enforcement, and I believe in a different pro approach to creating safety, one that doesn't include increased policing. I'm currently staying at a shelter where I am constantly reminded of the racist and classist behavior of the NYPD. I see police almost always surrounding the shelter. Just the other day, last week, I was harassed and pepper sprayed by the NYPD while receiving derogatory language. Is this protection? I'm constantly seen as a queer trans person of color. This is why I'm not fe I'm fearful of the police. They do not have me, they do not and have me, have me and they have not kept me safe. Instead of assuming the NYPD can create safety, we urge the city to redirect this energy around police reform to cutting down NYPD's already bloated budget and invest in our communities. We need resources and community safety and not a city funded police reform program. Locking people up isn't working. We need mental health services. We need to address the homeless crisis and offer resources and harm reduction programs to treat drug addiction. I hope that the committee can continue to listen to voices that are directly impacted by police violence and take the right measures to create a plan around safety that is protecting communities and not rooted in the New York PD's per budget. Thank you again, Jasmine, a member of the New York Anti-Violence Project Program. Thank you for your testimony. Um, let's let's try Carla Rabinowitz one last time, um, and and I'll just while we're getting that set up, I, I, Carla, I'll remind you you can also submit your testimony um, in writing that we will certainly review. Can you hear me? Yes. So my name is Carla. I'm the project coordinator of CCIT NYC. We're a coalition of 85 organizations and 700 stakeholders whose mission is to transform how the city responds to mental health crisis. I also work at Community Access with the lovely Gal Adigan. So CCIT is of the view that resources need to be diverted away from the NYPD to mental health teams to respond to all the 200,000 911 calls the city receives annually. We ask you to carve out 16.5 million, 3.3 million a year for a, a start, a small project. We developed this project three years ago. It has an EMT, it has a peer, uh, it's 24 seven, it's a great project. Um, we believe it's essential that the responses to these 200,000 crisis calls be peer driven. If you heard of the last shooting on Friday, what the police did was they tried to get him to the hospital. They thought they would be nice, like go to the hospital. A peer would have known that wouldn't work. That just escalated the guy because he had just been in the hospital. He didn't want to go back to the hospital. That's why we think the, the response has to be a peer model. But we also believe it needs to be available to the general public. It does no good if it goes to a government agency. General public needs a number, like a 988 number, to get it. Um, so I tell you this, and one of the reasons I co-started CCIT 10 years ago is because I was a person who was involved with the police a lot. I was sick. I was doing crazy things. I was involved with the police. So I want to end on a good note today. I got help. I got help. I got a job and my life got back together. But too many mental health recipients in crisis never get the help, they get killed by the police. Um, the numbers again, it's actually 20 mental health recipients have been shot or, or died. 16 have died in the last five years, 14 of whom were black. And um, compare that to years before the training, there were much less death. We need a new peer-driven healthcare response. The one the city has is clinicians. Clinicians may do the same thing to the guy you know, go to the hospital. If you're a peer, you're getting to the underlying cause of what's going on. You're not just stopping the crisis right there. The peers are gonna go in and they're going to figure out, you know, how do we get you connected to services? What's the long-term plan? So we urge you to examine our proposal. It's readily available. It's 16.5 for five years. Uh, and we think it'll pay it for itself um, with the less lawsuits. Um, and just get the police out of the healthcare job. They were never designed for it. They're not appropriate. Thank you. 
Thank you for your testimony. Um, okay, the next panelists will be representatives from Bro and Sis Seoul. I believe there's two that we have, um, and we'll go in order as marked uh, number one and number two, uh, followed by Tawaki Kamatsu and Shaylee Severino. So let's turn yeah. to rep number one. Good afternoon. I'm actually here to support the young person, so you can go directly to rep number two. Thank you. begins now. Okay. Hi, my name is Nabitu and I'm speaking on behalf of youth at the Brotherhood Sister Soul. Um, police reform is one divest divesting monies from the NYPD and investing in things that make our community better and to explicitly removing both police and policing culture from school. Failure to do so is not at all what our communities have demanded. Our city continues to fail our youth. Today, New York City is far from where it needs to be to ensure student access as our school face troubling realities. NYC has the most segregated school systems in America. According to the New York City Council in our public schools, 74.6% of Black and Latin students attended school with less than 10% white students. Additionally, 34.3 of white students attended school with more than 50% white students. School segregation leads to chronic underfunding, underfunding of schools in New York State, which has negative and disparate impact for Black, Latin, and low-income students given subsequent resource disparity. Only 77.3 of 1.1 million children in the DOE system will graduate on time, and only 55% of NYC high school graduates will graduate college early. One in 10 NYC public school students is houseless. Additionally, in a nation in which 14 million students are in school with police, but no counselor, nurse, psychologist, or social worker, New York City has more school safety agents, SSAs, than any other school's district in the US. The presence of police in our schools has disproportionately impacted students who are low income black and Latin who are likely to be subject to exclusionary discipline police response at school than their white peers. Everyone in the city council, however, has the power to shift this, beginning with meaningfully shifting funds from police, reforming their responsibilities and reinvesting in our communities. Our vision for education in New York City includes safe, restorative, healing environment where all students have the opportunity to learn and grow. To meet this goal, we must pursue policies that value and respect the dignity of students, caregivers, and their communities. This requires providing school equitable resources, adopting a culturally responsive curriculum, preventing trauma, repairing harm, and promoting restorative practices. To do so, we at the Brotherhood Sister So, alongside a number of other youth organizations and organizers, demand structural shift, police free schools, and enter all structures that systematically push students out of classes as part of policing culture, fully funding our schools as so that so as to center students' access and social emotional support, expanding and transforming youth civic power, cultural shifts, educate educators center trauma informed approaches, city leaders reimagine fund and staff meaningful student and community led safety strategies, schools that center healing, expanded evidence-based training for school teams as to eliminate the criminalization of marginalized students. Pedagogical shifts. Continue. School institutionalized and fund comprehensive sex education and NYC culturally responsive education and civic education equitable distribution of technological resources to all student language access for families and students, equitable access for students and families with disabilities and slash or who are neurodivergent. All youth deserve safe, high quality, holistic, positively transformative educational experiences. If we believe in equity and want to create the future, all New York students deserve, we must build within our school systems of accountability, restorative justice, and behavior management that we do not include 
that does not include the NYPD. We must close the billion dollar funding gap that exists for our schools so that we can begin to address the systemized oppression our students face as a result of a legacy of ignoring the needs of black, brown and low income communities. We must deconstruct the school to prison pipeline and broken window policy and truly decriminalize low level offenses that lead to our youth having negative concept with the state and carceral system and we must do this now. Thank you for letting me share my testimony. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, next up will be Tawaki Kamatsu, followed by Shaylee Severino. Time starts now. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah, so I'm Tawaki Kamatsu. Um, there are a few people in today's public hearing. Um, I have a federal lawsuit against the city. Juanita Holmes, she testified earlier today. She's one of my defendants in my federal lawsuit. Um, so is Sergeant Bradley. Bradley. There was a public hearing on what November 13, 2019, that Sergeant Bradley illegally kicked, kicked me out of um, that was conducted by uh, Richie Torres. I talked to you, Mr. Adis, about that previously. Um, so the purpose of today's testimony is really for the benefit of the public to try to have them, I guess, tag team with me in my federal lawsuit to join me as co-plaintiffs to submit amicus curiae briefs um, to the attention of federal judge Edgardo Ramos, as well as federal judge uh, Lorna Schofield. Um, the case numbers are 20 CV 7046. That's for the one assigned to Judge Ramos. And for the one assigned to Judge Schofield, that is 18 CV 3698. My email address, in case you want additional information um, to help you to submit filings, I'll say it slowly T O W A K I underscore K O. M A T S U at yahoo.com. I'm going to submit written material for today's uh, hearing. Also, today's hearing itself was conducted in violation of New York State's open meetings law. So I'm going to ask the federal judge to effectively void today's hearing. I emailed Mr. Adis during today's hearing. I didn't get a response. Um, Johanna Castro made fraudulent statements to me um, addressed to Judge Ramos recently on December 21st. So I'm going to see if I can add her as a defendant um, in my federal lawsuit, in addition to Mr. Bradley, who I see on the right side of the screen. Um, so that's pretty much all I have to say, except for one other thing. I recently commenced two new sets of uh, federal litigation in response to the fact that I prevailed against NYPD in litigation that involved an illegal stop and frisk. I won that case pretty much on my own. I'm now pursuing a countersuit. I was also illegally prevented from testifying on March 8th of 2018 in a public hearing that the mayor conducted about NYPD reforms. I testified previously to Ms. Adams. She's totally useless. She sat in the committee room while I testified. She didn't do a darn thing in response to my testimony. So in regards to her, her status as the chairman of the public safety committee, there's absolutely no reason whatsoever for her to be a part of the council, not to mention the uh, committee on public safety. Have a good day. Thank you for your testimony. Um, Final witness will be uh, Shaylee Severino. Time starts now. I don't believe we can hear you. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Hello. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Yep. You may begin. That I can't hear you guys now. All right. Okay. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for the time today, and thank you, Chair Adams, and all leadership on this call. My name is Shaylee Severino, and I'm speaking today from District 32 in Queens, which is home to the largest population of active duty and retired officers in all of the city. Respective support for the NYPD is central to our district. Unfortunately, discrimination, abuse, and systemic racism within our police is also central to this district. The two are not mutually exclusive. They're not either or, us versus them issues. And the continued vital and distrust profit serves no one. We have to change not only through protocols and through practices, but through the culture of policing that exists in our city. We need to bring down the blue wall of silence that pervades police departments and finally acknowledge that the changes are definitely needed are long overdue. The word transparency accountability seems to be taken as a soundbite and the real implementation of what we need to see has not occurred. 
Words such as dedicated, changes, reforms are all baseless without action. We are past the time of recommendations and we have been demanding these changes, not just now, but for years. Black and Latinx youth, men and women continue to be targeted through the quota system and qualified immunity continues to allow officers that break the law or abuse their power to hide behind their badges to avoid consequences. We have a current model in, in police system right now that takes the role of both preventing and reacting to crime. And it's evident that the both cannot be done by the same department. We have overburdened our police force. And if we wanna be serious about this, we have to alleviate their workload and stop expanding their reach into other departments or to the creation of units that they're simply not equipped for. We are past the point of talking about reform, but implementing what we already know are gaps within the system that continues to marginalize, target, and murder the people in our community. We cannot expect police relations to be at peace when change has not been resolved. Some of these changes, and this is very minuscule to the amount of work that we need to do, include removing the blue wall of silence by adopting an independent elected board in which officers have the ability to report another without having to go to the same agency that we're trying to hold accountable. Removing qualified immunity and using technology such as body cameras as a burden of proof towards proving or condemning the conduct of an officer. We have to adopt a holistic approach to policing that looks at the root cause of crime like poverty, crime, inequality, and systematic racism. Simply putting more cops on the street or increasing the NYPD budget only makes us feel safer without actually making us safer in reality. It's time to stop the narrative that any attempt at reform is somehow an attack on or betrayal of our police. It, it is the opposite. By building trust, transparency, accountability, we are supporting our officers and centering communities that have been harassed and attacked and murdered countless times. It's time that we invest in what we know will work, invest in education, mental health resources, young and youth and community centers, enacting common sense reforms to put us on the path towards healing, trust, and process, progress. These demands, in addition to other all remarks made by other organizations and individuals here today, starts with city council intervention and ensures that these necessary changes become part of the discussion and actually implemented throughout as we move forward in this idea of how we move forward as a city. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, that is all the uh, public members of the public we have registered to testify. Are there any other members of the public who uh, have not given testimony who would like to give testimony? Okay, seeing no hands raised, uh, I will now turn back to Chair Adams for closing remarks. Thank you, Council. Well, to everyone that has hung in there with us, this has been just a little over five hours today. So you all have been um, amazing in hanging in there. Um, as we all see, we've got a lot of work to do. Um, this, this hearing um, has a specific purpose. So again, for all of you that we're here to testify. I thank you. For the family members, I thank you. We're gonna continue this work and we're gonna, we're gonna do the work. So I would like to thank all of my committee council and staff, including Daniel Addis, Kelly Taylor, Lewis Sheldon Brown, and Ebony Meeks Laidley, all of my colleagues, all of the witnesses uh, from start to finish today. Thank you for your testimony and thank you for being here today. It is now 3.02 and this hearing is now adjourned. Okay, we're open to live.